I've been covering all of the insanity that's already going on around the GOP primaries. So if you're new and you haven't watched any of the other videos, or if you've never read an article I've written, or you've never listened to the Belly of the Beast podcast, or you've never seen Enemy of the People, or maybe you're just going to go, I have seen some of your political content, but who the fuck are you, and why the fuck do you get an opinion on it, and why the fuck should I listen to it? So a little bit of background. I've been covering American politics, actually, longer than esports, if you can sort of wrap your head around that. I first started writing about it probably in the late 90s and you know I, I wrote for a bunch of college papers and then I was the editor of my university magazine and I did political editorials there and I've really followed it from a pretty early age I mean you know the first kind of like you know the first time I was really hyper aware of a political campaign and everything it entailed was probably the 1992 campaign which you know was 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 Clinton Bill Clinton, and you had the Ross Perot Independent and stuff in there, and there was loads of like interesting stuff. And I was very young, but I've I've always paid attention to it because ultimately, for good or ill, American politics do largely dictate where everyone else fucking falls in line. You know, for the rest of the world, and and American politics has become more and more insane progressively more polarized and i've talked about this a lot as well i was there at the moment it happened it was obviously in 2000 um when uh, when that totally not rigged election happened and so in that moment uh the dnc basically said we're never going to get god again there's lots of books about this you can read uh, i've got the, i'd recommend a book called uh, the red and the blue um but um pe pe people know there was a sea change in the democrats at that time and they were just like these republicans are so fucking dirty we're gonna have to fight fire with fire and now for me just looking at it kind of objectively where we're at uh, when it comes to political shenanigans the dems are just like nothing else i mean like they are really uh, hyper fixated on winning at all costs and because they now have the institutional power because of where the pendulum swung back to and the policies uh, and the positions that are always going to be sympathetic to the people in, you know, coming through academia and the people working in the media and the arts, then obviously, yeah, uh, you end up with a lot of people all giving a concerted effort towards pushing this political party as being the only choice, which isn't to say I fuck with the Republicans, but I think it's kind of naive to frame everything one po in a two party system. You can't divide the parties up into good and evil. <laughs> <laughs> that's stupid uh so anyway but people do do that and it's been that's been happening and so these gop primaries present an interesting conundrum because what's happening at the moment is trump it, the specter of trump uh kind of hovers over american politics Amer the, the existence of trump is where american politics finally irreparably broke itself he wasn't ever meant to win an election he wasn't ever meant to be elected but the political class in america is so repulsive trump was able to deceive the people into thinking he's non-establishment and to a lot of people he actually represents a better alternative to a career politician, which should really, the career politicians at that point should have took stock and gone, should we become more relatable and likable? But no, instead, they completely fucking doubled down. Now, the last eight years has just been this Trump, 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 and everyone's sick of it. So what's happened now is somehow to, to stop Trump getting a second term, we did a full court press unprecedented levels of ballot harvesting media coverage media bias um and just good coordination from the dnc to get a man with obvious dementia who's not fit for office into the white house so they can just push through all the policies they wanted to push through without him really knowing where he is uh, and the only thing biden's biden the presidency's been a disaster and i mean this i like i get it I get it people don't like Trump but if you only look at the if you only look at Biden's accomplishments through the lens of but he's not Trump you're really doing yourself a disservice Biden's presided over some unprecedented financial disasters for the US he's the withdrawal from Afghanistan is one of the most shameful episodes in American foreign policy and uh, yeah people go yeah but Trump agreed that yeah but Biden enacted it Biden still hasn't got any kind of you know, I mean, there's still Americans stuck out there. There's a ton of reasons why the Biden administration has been an abject failure. So what they need is, what's the only thing that can get Biden re-elected? A universally and almost unprecedented dislikable candidate, and that's Trump. 
and so where we're at now is all the other gop candidates all the other people in the primary are all essentially in second place at best because trump is so far ahead in the polls and what's happening is the dnc are even funding you know trump picks and stuff like this in the elections while simultaneously saying trump's the biggest threat to our democracy of all time yet they're funding trumpists in local races because they think they can beat them and they can because trump is unfortunately sort of a loser uh he can't pick a winner and he's brought the republican party to 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 functional ruin and created a schism in the republican party that can't be addressed yet he still remains massively ahead in the polls and so what's happened now is we're now coming into these you know like debates here and the dnc uh, you know the democrat controlled uh, states are trying to take him off the primary ballot that's the new thing and I, again spoiler who told you that was coming oh yeah it was me yeah it turns out i do know what i'm talking about and there's no constitutional basis to do it they're invoking the four, the third paragraph of the 14th amendment which wasn't even invoked when an actual political candidate in a presidential candidate in 1920 was an agent of the communist party pledging to destroy america so that's how robust it is it's garbage it's bollocks it will be overturned by the supreme court but that's kind of the point because then the democrats get to turn around and go look see trump's supreme court is illegitimate as well they're letting an insurrectionist run so they're doing everything they're doing everything they can to get enough sympathy for trump in the primary that the gop thinks he can really win they nominate him and then they jam him up with the legal stuff the media absolutely smashes him and maybe they do somehow find states to take him off the presidential ballot and not just the primary ballot so you need to know that's the landscape that we're in at the particular moment in time this debate did happen before he was taken off the ballots but that's the end goal that's the game plan for dnc they need trump to run against biden they need that that's what galvanizes their base now all of that said the gop will be committing political suicide if they actually pick him and so you have to kind of hope that maybe desantis or Haley, and i can't stand her are going to get the nod as we went into the fourth debate it got down to just Chris Christie, Vivek Ramaswamy, Ron DeSantis, and Nikki Haley. They were the only people really left in the running. They were the only people that hit the bar to be in the, the, what ended up being the final debate. Chris Christie is polled at 5% or less solidly. Ramaswamy is polled between 5% and 9%, but was polling at 5% coming in. Ron DeSantis went from polling at the start when he announced his candidacy almost as much as Trump to 21%. 13 percent 11 percent and now nikki haley has jumped above him as a more viable republican candidate which i don't see but ron DeSantis's campaign for the primary has been uh, a little bit insipid so we go into this we go into this debate chris christie is out he's there just to say trump bad we've seen that time and time again Ron DeSantis is standing on his record as governor of Florida, where he won by a landslide, and saying, look what we did in For uh, Florida. We fought the woke agenda. Spoiler. <laughs> Before this, he had a nightmarish 1v1 debate with Gavin Newsom, who the DNC have deployed to actually campaign on Biden's behalf, because Biden's brains are applesauce. And it didn't help him out. And it hurt him in the polls and put Nikki Haley in the second, to a point where there was reporting Trump saying, maybe Nikki Haley will be my VP. That'll never happen. The Dark Lord does not share power. But anyway, so all of that's going on vivek knows he's got a swing for the fences he's in it to the end he thinks he's going to surprise people in iowa he keeps talking about it he's also doing this thing at the moment of saying our true enemy is yet to reveal itself implying hillary clinton's gonna or gavin newsom or someone else is going to be the real uh, presidential candidate and biden's not going to run i don't know why he's, you know there's no indication of that at the moment but anyway so this debate is vivek going absolutely insane and i have to prepare you for it he just goes full crazy this is the this is the most crazy vivek has been in a debate and that is saying something because he's already said some crazy shit he's invoking starship trooper laws so he's here and he, he's got things he's got things to say so I, i've set it all up for you 
We're all prepared. Oh, and yeah, this was on. Sorry, I said Newsmax earlier. It, this is News Nation. This is News Nation, not Newsmax. Don't confuse them. Uh, but yeah, News Nation, relatively new startup kind of like news company. Chris uh, Cuomo's over there, obviously, after losing his job at uh, CNN. And anyway, they're a bit more. You know, they're, they're actually critical of the regime, and they were very... It's quite a coup for them, not like the one on January the 6th. <laughs> right, it was quite a coup for them to fucking get the rights to sort of having a GOP debate. Although, actually, as it turns out, no one was watching these. And as I said, shortly after this, they just fucking said, yeah, that's enough of that, eh? Let's have a, let's have a Brexit on them GOP primary debates, because everyone just says the same shit, so... <laughs> college football. But on this night, the final showdown of the year moves to a new stage on America's newest cable news network. It's good to know, isn't it, that the immediate comparison for a political debate where you're meant to be learning about the policies of your future leader is just being compared to college football. <laughs> it's just the same. But it's what I mean. I was saying this to someone the other day, actually, in a bookshop, because I'm a, I'm a pretentious wanker, but we were talking about it. And um, I said, you know, it's like why, it's why so many sports writers, when they end up writing about politics, all sports writers want to write about politics, they end up writing really good copy for politics, because if you just view it as a fucking game, just, you know, red and blue sports ball, a lot of the invective, a lot of the language will just transfer over, so, you know. 40 days before the Iowa caucuses, millions of votes are still up for dill up for grabs. And four candidates are fighting for every last one of them. And, and one of them, Chris Christie, is fighting for breath. Right, that's the only fat joke I'm going to do about Chris Christie. But let Who could catch fire and shock the political world? 2024 is do or die for us. We're not getting a mulligan on this. Governor Ron DeSantis. We have to have a new generational leader. Former Ambassador Nikki Haley. You're either pro-American or you're anti-American. That is the choice we face. Vivek Ramaswamy. We deserve better character in the White House. Former Governor Chris Christie. Live on News Nation. News for all America. The lights are on. The field is set. <laughs> it's game day in Alabama. It's game day. It's game day in Alabama. Let's go. Woo. Welcome to the and final oh, hang on. Let's turn the subtitles off. Here. Of the year live from the University of Alabama. I'm Megan Kelly, host of the Megan Kelly Show podcast on Sirius XM. I'm Eliana Johnson with the Washington Free Beacon. And I'm Elizabeth Vargas with News Nation, and we are live on News Nation and the CW. It is make or break time for the candidates on this stage right now. With literally not make or break time. <laughs> like, it's literally not. It's, it's just a debate. They didn't even know it was the last debate at this point, I don't think. Primary starting just weeks away. And we have a lot to cover over the next two hours. So let's begin with tonight's rules. Candidates will have 90 seconds to answer questions, 60 seconds to give a rebuttal at the moderator's discretion. You will all see the timing lights that will indicate when time is up and it's time to stop talking. And the time we have is critical over the next it's time few to stop hours, talking, so all right. we ask the audience to please keep your applause to a minimum. All right, with that, let's get started. On stage tonight, four candidates, all vying to become their party's nominee. And given the state of affairs in our political system right now, one of you might very well do it. Even many Democrats now admit that President Biden is a weak candidate. Just as many Republicans acknowledge that former President Donald Trump's multiple legal troubles could imperil his quest for a second term. All of which means one of you could wind up the leader of the free world. Having said that... So free. Mr. Trump is nearly 50 points ahead of all of you in the national polls. 29 points ahead in Iowa, where the GOP caucuses are less than six weeks away. And so, as Republicans get ready to vote on whether any of you might be preferable to Mr. Trump, we begin with the question of electability. Governor DeSantis, 
Your campaign and its super PAC have spent the most money, had the most high net worth <laughs> donors, and had a wave of momentum coming into this race after your big re-election win in Florida. You were seen by many as the candidate most likely to consolidate the non-Trump field. But here we are, a month out from the first real votes, <sighs> this is and you haven't managed to do it. Savage. In fact, Nikki Haley is beating Hates you it. in New Hampshire and South Carolina now. Look at him going full fucking skinwalker as well. He's like, Look at that, I, would, I will devour you. How dare you say these things to me? But he's, he's got to keep it friendly. And closing in on you. Got in them Iowa. fucking just not to mention killer eyes, dude. Who is not only dominating in the early states, but is beating you in Florida by over 30 points. <laughs> is You're it fair to say Senator Tim Scott did when he dropped out that voters are telling you not no, but not now. So we have a great uh, idea in America that Holy the voters shit. actually make these decisions. Too dank. Not pundits or pollsters. Uh, I'm sick of hearing about these polls because I remember those polls in November of 2022. They said there was going to be a big red wave. It was going to be monumental. And that crashed and burned. It did. One place it didn't crash and burn was in the state of Florida. They weren't predicting to, uh, that I would win the way I did. And I won the greatest Republican victory in the history of the state of Florida. I'm looking forward to, to Iowa and New Hampshire. The voters are gonna be able to speak and we're gonna earn this nomination. And here's what we need. Uh, I am sick of Republicans who are not willing to stand up and fight back against what the left is doing to this country. You've got to be willing to stand strong and you've got to be willing to beat these people. I'm the only one running for president that has beaten these people on issue after issue. Uh, we beat the teachers unions when we did school choice. We beat Fauci on COVID. We beat George Soros when we removed two of his radical district attorneys. We beat the Democrats on election integrity. I have delivered results. That's what we need for this country. And you have other candidates up here like Nikki Haley. She caves anytime the left there you comes go, after, see? anytime the media comes. So this is a this is a real about change. You know, if you've watched all four of these debates now, you will notice that like that in in this one, one of the things you're going to see is Ron attacks Nikki Haley a lot. He knows now that the foot races. He's not. In, he, he doesn't have to give grace anymore and just be like there he's now got to fight he's now got to try and leapfrog her in the polls again vivek also massively attacking nikki Haley. i mean he's done that consistently throughout they gen genuinely do not vibe with each other that's fine he did it with christy as well vivek as i said is an agent of chaos he just doesn't give a fuck it's wild but you know ron a lot in this debate is going to be fucking throwing uh shit at N nikki haley because he's now got to try and prove that he is still a viable candidate and remember all bets are off by the way this is the interesting thing about primaries i meant to say this in, in the preamble but i forgot to mention it i keep telling people this so two common questions that come up every time they say why are there no democrat debates uh, a lot of people have accused me of not covering the democrat debates because i'm woke and i'm only mocking the republicans and i won't mock the democrats right there are no debates for me to cover because incumbent presidents i think it's been this way since jimmy carter incumbent presidents don't debate because they are the presumptive nominee so they don't go out and sing for their supper. Now, some Democrats and plenty of Republicans have called for Joe Biden to go and have debates. He will certainly not be debating other people in his field. But if he did, it'd be a disaster because he's got no brains, quite literally. So that comes up all the time. That's why there's no uh, Democrat debates. You run the incumbent. That's generally your best path to victory unless there's a you know ton of crazy things. The other thing that people don't seem to understand, it has been ruled time and time again by the highest courts in america a primary race is little more than a theatrical courtesy what do i mean by that let's say trump wins all the primaries right let's say he, he, in all of the states so he's on the primary ballot he wins and he is he in and he's proven himself to be far and away the most popular candidate they have the gop is under no legal obligation irrespective of the votes to choose him as a candidate in fact it would be perfectly legal be difficult but it would be perfectly legal for the gop to pick a presidential candidate that didn't even run in the primaries this has been ruled time and time again 
This is how it works. The reason primaries exist is so parties can get a, bar you know, put the barometer out, get a temperature check, whatever you want to call it, as to who's popular and has the best chance to win. But they're under no obligation to pick the person that does the best. And so essentially, all of this is political theater, right? And so what you have to do is hang in there. And that's where DeSantis is now. You know, he's hanging in. He wants to, you know, win enough to convince the GOP that they can pick him and he can win in a presidential. Because in a presidential, all bets are off. Whoever they pick, they're going to back to the hilt. Whoever they pick, if you're pissed off with Joe Biden, the only other candidate you can vote for is the GOP nominee. And as I said, I think if they ran DeSantis against Biden, the, the polling data suggests he wins in most swing states by 1% or 2%. Uh, in six of the nine swing, no, seven of the nine swing states, I think it was, Trump clears Biden as well. But that's now, and not with... A year essentially of sustained my Trump is bad, my fascism, Trump is Hitler, a threat to democracy, legal troubles, court cases. So that would slowly erode. And then, yes, of course, I haven't even talked about Robert Kennedy's well, I mean, he's on the ballot. Marion Williamson, this is the this is the other interesting thing. The DNC have told Marion Williamson she won't. Marion Williamson, who's polling at like thirteen percent with like the Zoomers, because she talks about like birds and flowers and the environment, and she, you know, she's like the fucking wine aunt of American politics. I've got no problem with her actually. I'd vote for her over Biden in a fucking heartbeat. The DNC aren't going to put her on the ballot in some places. Robert Kennedy, a lifelong fucking Democrat, isn't being recognized by the DNC as a legitimate candidate. And everyone in the media is saying, well, if he runs as an independent, all he's going to do is pull votes from Trump. Trump voters are in a cult of personality with, tr with Trump. They love Trump. Trump doesn't matter what Trump does. The average Trump supporter goes, uh, don't take the vaccine. Trump made the motherfucking vaccine. The Dems poisoning us. I'm a true blood. Trump did that, you fucking idiot. So pick a lane. So they're in a, they're in a cult of personality with their guy. They're not voting for anyone. They're not voting for anyone else. They're locked in with him. Robert Kennedy will pull votes from Biden because if you're a principled Democrat, you can't vote for Biden. But you could vote for another Democrat candidate. It's just they ain't going to run him. So I think if Robert Kennedy ran as an independent, it's not he's not going to win. He's not going to he's not going to win a state. Probably you know like. But he's he he would pull votes from I think from the Blues rather than from the Reds. That's my read on it. Everyone else disagrees with it. Anyway, that again that's where we're at. So things to think about as you watch these answers and the mudslinging after I did a bill in Florida to stop the gender mutilation of minors. It's child abuse and it's wrong. She opposes that bill. She thinks it's fine and the law shouldn't get involved with it. If you're not willing to stand up for the kids, if you're not willing to stand up and say that it is wrong to mutilate these kids, uh, then you're not going to fight for the people back home. I will fight for you and I will win for you. Ambassador Haley. You left government service in 2018 with just $100,000 in the bank. Five years later, you're reportedly worth it's a question. million. Questions a banger. Lucrative corporate speeches and board memberships like you had with Boeing. Weeks ago, you met with Wall Street heavyweights, including leaders from J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and BlackRock. Several other billionaire investors are reportedly ready to endorse you, or recently have, all of which comes with expectations. Aren't you too tight with the banks and the billionaires to win over the GOP's working class base, which mostly wants to break the system, not elect someone beholden to it? Well, thank you. It's great to be here. You know, first I'll tell you, um, just to respond to Ron, I, he mm. continues to lie about my record. I actually said his don't say gay bill didn't go far enough because it only talked about gender until the third grade. And I said it shouldn't be done at all, that that's for parents to talk about. It shouldn't be talked about with schools. In reference to donors coming on board, look, we will take support from anybody we can take support from. But I have been a conservative fighter all my life. I was a Tea Party candidate when I became governor. We 
opposed every single corporate bailout we possibly could. We passed tort reform. We passed one of the toughest illegal immigration laws in the country. We passed pro-life bills. We moved an unemployment from 11 percent to 3 percent. We took on the unions, and we took on Obama. Oh, yeah, Nikki Haley was deep on yeah. Syrian refugees and everything in between. And so I've had a fight. And so as much as Ron says that, that's not true. But when it comes to these corporate people that want to suddenly support us, We'll take it, but you can, they don't, I don't ask them what their policies are. They ask me what my policies are and I tell them what it is. Sometimes <laughs> they agree with me. Sometimes they don't. Some don't like how tough I am on China. Some don't like the fact that I've signed pro-life bill. Satan said to me, what's your policy on <laughs> wholesale mass murder and nonstop war? And I said, well, listen. I'm kind of for it. So Satan said, you know what? I have some fucking money, y'all. <laughs> and I, So I don't see any problem with this whatsoever. No one on that stage has shilled for the military-industrial complex more than Nikki Haley. Like, it's actually insane. And every time she's asked a question about foreign policy, it's very fucking clear where she's at with that. They're, like, a vote for her is, an, is a vote for another bullshit war in the Middle East, most likely Iran frankly so you know you've got to be mindful about that some don't like the fact that i may oppose corporate bailouts that doesn't matter that's who i am and that's why the most conservative grassroots group in the country americans for prosperity endorsed me last week well she didn't respond i also want to make it clear that um she'll do she'll do she'll play well to an alabama crowd no doubt about it she's from the south but it's also worth pointing out because again if you don't know these things uh wealthy donors they fill out the crowd with like their people and so when you're hearing all this applause for it just remember through the lens that between debate three and debate four she took a bunch of donors she even took some donors from ron DeSantis, who don't believe his campaign's viable anymore she and all of a sudden you know every time she speaks she is the new fucking queen you know what i mean fucking republican kerrigan over here under the criticism it wasn't about the parents rights and education bill it was about prohibiting sex change operations on minors they do puberty blockers these are irreversible talk to chloe cole she went through this now she's an adult she's warning against it she may never be able to have kids again that is what nikki haley opposed she said the law shouldn't get involved in that and i just ask you if you're somebody that's going to be the president of the united states and you can't stand up against child abuse how are you going to be able to stand up for anything that, that is the truth I we, have it, we have it that. on video i what? said that i said that if you have to be 18 to get a tattoo, you should have to be 18 to have anything done to change you your gender. said the law should stay out of it. Let's finish with electability, but trust me, we're coming back to this issue. Mr. Ramaswamy, for months you campaigned as a unifier. Then you stood up at the first debate and attacked all of your competitors. As Buckle up. <laughs> Buckle up, guys. Debate, you changed your tune saying, these are good people on this stage, admitting you can come across as a bit of a know-it-all and rejecting the practice of personal insults. By debate number three, you called Nikki Haley corrupt, accused Ron DeSantis of wearing high heels, and told Ambassador Haley she should keep a closer eye on her daughter. Can you see how this has led some to conclude you are not, in fact, a unifier, and to question your authenticity? <laughs> Megan, I think there's a time and place for everything. We need somebody in the White House who absolutely is going to be a fighter when it counts. And I did say that there were some good people on that stage in that third debate. Doug Burgum was on that stage at that time, and I'll, I'll say that jokingly. Ron DeSantis is a good person, too. I want to go back, though, to Nikki Haley's <laughs> comment earlier that she is somehow not responding uh. to the will of these donors. Nikki, you were bankrupt when you left the U.N. After you left the U.N., you became a military contractor. You actually started joining service on the board of Boeing, whose back you scratched for a very long time and then gave foreign multinational speeches like Hillary Clinton is, and now you're a multimillionaire. That math does not add up. It adds up to the fact that you are corrupt. And when I said they were bought and paid for, I meant the Republican establishment, not the Democratic establishment. Now you have Reid Hoffman, the person who's effectively George Soros Jr., funding lawsuits across this country against Donald Trump to keep him off the ballot, funding left-wing causes, we discovered this week that he is one of Nikki Haley's largest supporters. Oh, yeah. Larry Fink, the king of the woke industrial complex, the ESG movement, the CEO of BlackRock, the most powerful company in the world, now supporting Nikki Haley. 
And to say that doesn't affect her is false, because it's after that meeting later that day that she says that every American needs to be doxxed by having their ID, their government-issued ID, tied to what they say, she did say on that. the internet. So I think that this is far more She tried to walk it back, but you didn't say it, Nikki. Politics, but I will say this. It is going to take a leader from the outside, with fresh legs, from the next generation to unite this country. Not the broken politicians who are puppets of the puppet masters, but the actual people in this country. Thomas Jefferson was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence. I think it's going to take somebody whose best days in life are still ahead to see a country whose best days <coughs> Are ahead of itself and i think i can reach that next generation better than anybody else in this race thank you Response. he was on tiktok yo first of all we weren't bankrupt when i left the u.n we're people of service my husband is in the military and i served our country as u.n ambassador and governor it may be bankrupt to him, but it certainly wasn't bankrupt to us. Secondly, I did serve on the board of Boeing. I did a lot mm. of work with Boeing when I was governor. They were a great partner to me. Oh, I, I bet. served for 10 months. And then when they decided after COVID that they wanted to go for a corporate bailout, I've never supported corporate bailout, so I respectfully stepped back and got off the board. I love Boeing. They build good commercial airplanes. They build airplanes for our Air Force. I am proud of them. They employ a lot of people in South Carolina. But that's why I left the Boeing board. There's nothing to what he's saying. And in terms of these donors that are supporting me, they're just yeah. jealous. <laughs> they wish that they were supporting them. But I'm not going to sit there and do that. Give me a break. So, and, and Vivek, he jealous? wrote a book talking about ESG and these woke corporations in BlackRock. The idea that I want to do that in Florida, they were managing our pension, part of our pension. And then when they did the ESG, I took $2 billion away from BlackRock. We took action. This ESG is called environment, <laughs> social remember. governance. And again, Nikki is- $2 billion from BlackRock? Uh, they want to use economic power to impose a left-wing agenda on this country. They want basically to change society without having to go through the constitutional process. We've kneecapped it in the state of Florida. The next president of the United States needs to be able to go to that office on day one and end ESG. And the fact of the matter is, we know from her history, Nikki will cave to those big donors when it counts. And I'm, that is not acceptable. Never, never, like, as I said, this debate, uh, I know El Gapo's in the chat. Uh, by the way, I love the last meme you made of me. Uh, as, it was me and Thorin as a conjoined twin. Uh, but I, I, I don't want to show it on stream in case it's against some sort of policy. <laughs> but it was funny. But I'll just say this. Ron DeSantis, I, and yeah, I did have nightmares. Uh, <laughs> Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy as the fucking tag team Legion of Doom just going in on fucking Nikki Haley in a squash match. It's fucking ridiculous. Well, I, I did write that book, Ron, and the irony is Nikki Haley was heaping praise on me when I wrote that book, but now I worry I was warning about the woke industrial complex in this country as a warning. Apparently, she read it as a how-to manual, All just right, like okay. to read George Orwell's books <laughs> okay. All right, as well. Up. And so I think that that's actually far more dangerous than... I, this is really important for people to understand. We're marching towards fascism under Biden. Jack Smith has <clears throat> subpoenaed every last retweet that someone has issued from Donald Trump in the year 2020. The only person more fascist than the Biden regime now is Nikki Haley, who thinks the government should identify every one of those individuals <laughs> with an ID. That is not freedom. That is fascism. And she should come nowhere near the levers of power, let alone the White House. I've got to get to Governor Christie. I haven't forgotten no, about you, No, but can I just say but these can you, guys... Can, can you speak... To, can I you, really appreciate how that. How are you doing, sir? Good, good to see you. Can you please speak to the, the <laughs> requirement good to be you said... Is there a buffet? Every anonymous internet user needs to out themselves. They're both hitting you on it. I would be happy to, and I love all the attention, fellas. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, you know, I will, I'll say this. What I said was that social media companies need to show us their algorithms. I also said there are millions of bots on social media right now. They're foreign, they're Chinese, they're Iranian. I will always fight for freedom of speech for Americans. We do not need freedom of speech for Russians and Iranians and Hamas. We That's need social said. media right. companies right. to go That's and fight back on yeah. all of these Guys, you, you all know about those Iranian <laughs> social media mom, bots, right? As a mom, do I think that social media would be more civil if we went and had people's names next to that? Yes, I do think that because I think we've got too much cyberbullying. I think we've got child pornography and all of those things. 
But having said that, I never <laughs> think we? the government should go and require anyone's That's name. False. He what said I, I said want your name. Republicans. <laughs> the United States, her first day in office, she said one of the first things I'm going to do I said we were going to get media the millions of bots. Name. She wants That's government she ID to dox every American. American. That's what, what she what? said. You can roll the tape. She said, I want your name. And that was going to be one of the first things she did in office. And then she got real serious blood. Now, Ron DeSantis has been wrong on a couple of things he's stung Nikki Haley with. Uh, and she's been right on a couple of things he's denied. Uh, in this instance, fact, uh, it's a real life fact check. She absolutely did say, I want your name. She absolutely did propose. Because you see, when you're a Westoid, as the cool kids say, when you're a Westoid, you only look through social media through a very narrow lens of, well, well people are hurting my feelings and I want to get them. But the reality is, and that's the West Westoid, you know, if you're a powerful person. I mean, dude, I've probably, like, I've, I've been there. You know, when someone is anonymously fucking with you endlessly and there's no recourse, yeah, it's very frustrating. Can be, can be a very miserable experience, especially if you're dealing with someone so mentally ill and, and so, like, they've got nothing else in their life. You know, they're not tying down a, a job or a family. All they have is harassing you. And I know a lot of content creators that have gone through that shit. They would do anything, sort of get that person's identity, be able to report them to the police and do it. But here's the downside to that. If you make it the norm that everyone has to sign up to social media with actual identity tied to it, you're stopping whistleblowers. You're stopping people that live in countries that might want to use social media to meet you know, say say you're gay in Saudi Arabia and you want to meet other gay Saudi Arabians and you want to do it in secret without fear of the fucking state, you know, coming, abseiling through your window and fucking handcuffing you in the middle of the night and taking you away to a prison. You have to preserve anonymity on the internet as much as possible to protect the people for whom anonymity is an essential component of survival. And we lose sight of that over here because it, it ain't really about you know, we're not really about that shit. That's not what we use social media for. We use social media to fucking shill and grift and blare out our fucking, you know, dull, boorish opinions to people. And it's like when somebody goes, no, yeah, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and you go, look, I'm getting a death threat. By the way, spoiler, I'm more than aware I do this. I am ridiculing myself in this. Uh, you go, oh, in that moment, you go, oh, God, I wish I could get that cunt. I wish I could find their name and ruin their lives. But to have the tools to do that would come at the cost of making a lot of vulnerable people way more miserable. And that's why I would never support that. Like, actually, if it was presented, I would never support that. I might fucking you know say otherwise in the heat of the moment but like government legislation that would make that a must absolutely not and nikki haley has tried to walk this back but she absolutely did fucking say that and understandably so because it'd be a massive expansion of government actually, we have anonymous speech the federalist papers were written with anonymous writers. Jay, Madison, and Hamilton, they, they went under pubulus. It's something that's important, and especially given how conservatives have been attacked and, and, and they've lost jobs and they've been canceled. You know the regime would use that to weaponize that against our own people. Okay. Okay, it was so, a bad so idea. I have to say, I have to say, former governor of New this Jersey. This cracks me up because Ron is so it. hypocritical because he actually went and tried to push a law that would stop anonymous um, people from talking to the press and went so far to say bloggers should have to register with the state That's if they're going to talk about, write about elected officials. It was in the, check your newspaper. It was absolutely okay. there. Some okay. I have Senator never Hills Unfortunately, origin. There's not an origin plugin for OBS. Okay. You need a plugin, an ad block plugin. No, there isn't one. Usually, not somebody who gets missed. But okay, let's go. What's happening? Okay, I got you. He made a fat joke. You endorsed Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. You did. You gave him an A for his first term. Since then, however, you turned on him. Calling him a liar, a loser, a con man, and someone who... By the way, for all of those people in the chat, yeah, I mean, put it this way. If this... If this primary election was all about gyat, then you know what I'm saying? Chris Christie would have it in the back. All that cake. But unfortunately, it's not. But his ass is huge. You are absolutely correct. You cannot win. You've even said that you got into this race just to stop President Trump. His approval rating with Republicans is currently 
at 81 percent. I can use your Zuma words. <laughs> your best state is New Hampshire, and even there, two thirds of GOP voters say they would be angry and disappointed if you won. Respectfully, Governor, you have not stopped, Mr. Trump, and voters may wonder how you could possibly become the nominee of a party that does not appear to like you very much. Yeah. Well, look, Megan, um, it's often very difficult to be the only person on the stage who's telling the truth and the only person <laughs> who is taking on what needs to be taken on. I, I look at my watch now. We're 17 minutes into this debate, and except for your little speech in the beginning, we've had these three acting as if the race is between the four of us. The fifth guy, who doesn't have the guts to show up and stand here, he's the one who, as you just put it, is way ahead in the polls. And yet, I've got these three guys who are all seemingly to compete um, with, you know, Voldemort. He or shall not be named. They don't want to talk about it. The, the fact is that when you go and you say the truth about somebody who is a dictator, a bully, who has taken shots at everybody, whether they've given him great service or not over time, That's true. who dares to disagree with him, then I understand why the Thieves Three are timid to say anything about it. Maybe it's because they have future aspirations. Maybe those future aspirations are now, or maybe they're four years from now. But the fact of the matter is the truth needs to be told. And for us to go 17 minutes without discussing the guy who has all those gaudy numbers you talked about is ridiculous. I'm in this race because the truth needs to be spoken. He is unfit. This is a guy who just said this past week that he wants to use the Department of Justice to go after his enemies when he gets in there. Yeah, the imagine someone is, doing that. He is unfit to be president, and there is no bigger issue in this race, Megan, than Donald Trump, and those numbers prove it. Governor Chris. Mind you, just on that point, uh, I will add, it probably doesn't help alleviate anyone's fears when Steve Bannon went out speaking on behalf of Trump, although he's not in any way officially associated with the Trump campaign anymore. Uh, he said, oh, no, no, we're not joking. <laughs> <laughs> he's not joking when he says that we're absolutely gonna we're gonna fucking get you all <laughs> we're gonna use any means possible to get all of you and it's like yeah that's probably i don't know just di dial that one down if you're serious like uh dial that one down but yeah look look at that look at that he's got the guns he's got the gut he got all of that all of that cake. As we speak, the war is back on in Gaza. Israeli tanks are on the move and have surrounded the home of the leader of Hamas. Yep. Eight Americans have been held Get hostage him. in the tunnels beneath Gaza for 60 days now. Yep. Get American them. troops and warships in the Middle East are under attack. How far would you go as president to secure the release of those eight American hostages? And would it include sending American forces into combat? <laughs> you have to look out for our people when there are hostages. Commander in chief, you have to do whatever you can to get them done. But yeah. the overall issue get with them this done. is this administration is trying to hobble Israel from being able to defend itself. They have a right to eliminate Hamas and win a total and complete victory so that they never have to deal with this again. Hamas wants nothing less than a second Holocaust. They would wipe off every single Jew off the map. They would Correct. destroy the state of Israel if we could. Joe Biden will say they support Israel, and then they do nothing but try to kneecap them every step of the way. You should not try to direct their war effort. We should work together with them so that they can bring Hamas to heel. Look, I served uh, in, in Iraq back in the day. Uh, I'm the only one running for president that served in the military. Uh, I understand Please stop mentioning this, world. Ron. Uh, it's not the best part of the world. Uh, we do have you are a jag that Biden is leaving basically <laughs> in Guantanamo like, and you stop. have the Iranians that stop. are attacking these troops and he's responding with basically pinpricks if you harm an American service member you're gonna have hell to pay when I'm president we are not gonna let our troops Good. be sitting ducks <laughs> we also need to look at what's the underlying problem here Iran Biden is doing nothing to bring Iran to account you got to turn the screws on them don't let them have any oil revenue the money they get they send to Hamas, they send to Hezbollah, and they foment jihad throughout the Middle East. It is true so that Biden the Iranian state Iran does like he's pow empowered other funnel money into we Hamas and Hezbollah. Israel. They're our best ally in the Middle East. We have a unique relationship with them. And why they want to give all that money to that little dwarf kid, I don't know. The United but would you send Elizabeth, Elizabeth, look, this is the problem with the first three debates. 
Ron gets asked a question and he doesn't answer it. Your question was very specific. You said, would you send American troops as commander in chief? And he went on to this minute and 30 second Hosanna about his knowledge of the military and what we need to do and didn't answer your question. Look, when you're president of the United States, you're not gonna have a choice whether to answer that question or not. Your generals, your secretary of defense, your secretary of state, your national security advisor are gonna present plans to you. They're gonna look at you and say, do we go or don't we, Mr. President? And you can't give a 90 second speech about your military services. So would, you, as it would is. you send American troops in to rescue I those would hostages? Absolutely. Absolutely. If they had a plan which showed me that we could get them out safely, you're damn right I'd send the American army in there to get our people home and get them home now. And I'll answer that question directly. Thank you, Governor Christie. Mr. Ramaswamy, you have said it was irresponsible for Ambassador Haley to call Hamas's terrorist rampage an attack on America and for her to, quote, rabidly shout, finish them, end quote. <laughs> Rapidly shall finish them. She did do that though, didn't she? So fair. On Jews <laughs> the Holocaust. Why wouldn't it be a good thing to finish Hamas? Finish them was purposefully vague in a discussion that included Iran, which is yes. what I objected to. Yes. And I think it's as U.S. president, you have to be responsible. What happened to Israel was dead wrong. What Hamas did was medieval. It was subhuman. It was immoral. And we have to call that out for what it is on October 7th. But to say that that was an attack on America fails a basic test. I mean, Nick, if you can't tell the difference between where Israel is and the U.S. is on a map, I can have my three-year-old son show you the difference. <laughs> that is irresponsible because it has major consequences because that doesn't leave room for what actually is an attack on America. So I believe I have the strongest pro-Israel position actually on the stage, even though it's a little bit different than the standard GOP talking points. And it is this. The founding vision of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, the George Washington figure of Israel, what did he believe? He believed that we don't want, as Israel, to depend on the fleeting sympathies of the West and have our hands tied. I think Israel has an absolute right to defend itself to the fullest, without the U.S., the U.N., or the E.U., or anybody else second-guessing their decisions, as the Biden administration, guess what, is now starting to do. I think that's a more deeply pro-Israel position than anybody else, and it keeps the actual lines of accountability clear because it is a pro-American position. And as leader of the United States of America, just as a father of two sons, my sole moral duty is to my family. As your next president, my sole moral duty is to you, the people of this country. That's how I'm going to lead. So I'll tell Bibi, you smoke the terrorists on your southern border. You go ahead and we're rooting for you. We're going to smoke the terrorists on our own southern border. And that's how I'm going to lead this country. But Americans got to smoke them terrorists. Americans were killed in that attack. And so if you, if yes, you they were this terrorist attack and the number of Americans, this would be one of the top 10 terrorist attacks in American history. So our own people were killed in that attack. And mm. I think it's absolutely appropriate to point that out. Conveniently left out of the uh, media uh, narrative, I noticed. To work with Israel so that these people are brought to justice. I agree with that. Ambassador Haley, I'm See? coming to you. Legion of Doom. Iran is on the threshold of becoming a nuclear state. The Wall Street Journal reported that Iranian military leaders gave the green light for Hamas's attack on Israel. You said in last month's debate that, by contrast to the Biden administration's approach to Iran, you would, quote, punch them once and punch them hard. Were you saying that it's time to bomb Iran? No, I was not saying it's time to bomb Iran, uh, but I will tell you, but, I dealt with Iran every oh yeah. day when I was at the United Nations, and they only respond to strength. What they don't respond to is when you but, like they did on Iran that allowed China to send them billions to fill their proxies. What they don't respond to is when you give $6 billion for five hostages. That only makes them want more hostages. What they don't respond to is when they do 140 strikes on our men and women in Syria and Iraq, and we do nothing but just some small shots back. You've got to punch them, you've got to punch them hard, and let them know that. That's the only way they're going to respond. So the way you do that is you go after their infrastructure in Syria. What I find incredible about Nikki Haley's sort of foreign policy approach to Iran is I sort of remember my uncle saying this um, when he was, like, training a dog. And he was, like, saying, you know... If the dog does something bad, yeah, you've got to let it know. And let it know as boss, yeah? And then it won't do it again. And it's like, you are talking about 
a sort of sovereign nation politically as if it was like an infant or an animal it's it's so fucking ridiculous yeah you gotta punch them hard once then they respect you it ain't the first day in prison nicky it's fucking <laughs> do you know what i mean it's fucking this is geopolitics you mad bitch fucking wild Syria and Iraq where they're hitting our soldiers. That's what you do, and then that's when they'll back off. The problem is you have to see that all of these are related. If you look at the fact Russia was losing that war with Ukraine, Putin had hit rock bottom. They had raised the draft to 65. He was getting drones and missiles, drones from Iran, missiles from North Korea. And so what happened? When he hit rock bottom, all of a sudden, his other friend, Iran, Hamas goes and invades Israel and butchers those people on Putin's birthday. There is no... By the way, this point is so insane. And it shows why Nikki Haley should be disqualified as a candidate. She literally implied that uh, the October 7th atrocity was perpetrated because that date happened to be Putin's birthday and the thing is as well it was the opening day or night of shemini atzeret I, again apologies if i'm butchering that but it's an israeli celebration related to the uh, history of their country and so when hamas undertook the attack on that day it was specifically with that in mind and it had nothing to do with the fact that it's Vladimir Putin's birthday. Like, you know, fucking, like, in, in Nikki Haley's world, what happened was Vladimir Putin was sort of sat there. Well, he wasn't sat like that, was he? Because he's always holding on to the fucking desk and shaking these days, but he's fine. And he was like, and that's like Russian for, you know, like, oh, it's been a bit of a shit birthday, this. What with the fact that we're now international pariahs and we're getting fucking... Uh, I was talking backwards there, wasn't I? But, but now that we're international pariahs and everyone sanctioned us and all my billionaire mates are all getting fucked and everyone hates the fucking Kremlin, even people within my own fucking... <laughs> you know, even people within my own orbit. We did get Prigozhin, though. And one of his flunkies said, is there anything we could do for your birthday to cheer you up? And he went, well, you know... Even though I've got my own shit going on with that whole, you know, Donbass thing. Be wicked if Hamas attacked Israel. <laughs> and his flunky went, oh, I'll make right? And they and then like, you know, they fucking brought in a giant cake. Yeah, he's like they fucking a TV pops out and it's just those paragliders going into that music festival and he's oh, <laughs> Best birthday ever. Nikki Haley wants to be fucking president. Like, you know what I mean? And she, that's the world she's living in, conceptually. It, it's fucking mental. Like, there's, they're so desperate, Americans, to tie any sort of affront to their geopolitical worldview to Russia right now because it's politically convenient to do that. It's got to the point of utter embarrassment. And by the way, in these debates, uh, there should just be, like, trapdoors under all the candidates. And when they say something so stupid, it's disqualifying. The trapdoor should just open, like Austin fucking Powers style. And, should, you know, and, and that's it. Like, Hamas attacked Israel, not because of the significance of the religious festival uh, that Israel was celebrating, uh, but actually because it was Vladimir Putin's birthday mental no one happier right now than putin because all of the attention america had on ukraine suddenly went to israel and that's what they were hoping is going to happen we need to make sure that we have full clarity that there is a reason again that taiwanese want to help ukrainians because they know if ukraine wins china won't invade Taiwan. There's a reason the Ukrainians want to help Israelis because they know that if Iran wins, Russia wins. These are all connected. But what wins all of that is a strong America, not a weak America. And that's what Joe Biden's given us. I want to say one thing about the tie to Ukraine. <laughs> yeah. As if people are applauding that. Teenage girl living almost anywhere in rural Africa. Your ability to go to school is entirely. So foreign policy if you're a teenage girl in Africa, you've still got a better grasp of geopolitics than Nikki Haley. I want everybody at home to know that I was the first person to say we need a reasonable peace deal in Ukraine. Now a lot of the neocons are quietly coming along to that position, with the exceptions of Nikki Haley and Joe Biden, who still support this, what I believe is pointless war in Ukraine. 
And I think those with foreign policy experience, one thing that Joe Biden and Nikki Haley have in common is that neither of them could even state for you three provinces in eastern Ukraine that they want to send our troops to actually fight for. Look at that. And this is what I want people to understand. These people have, I mean, she has no idea what the hell the names of those provinces are, but she wants to send our sons and daughters and our troops me, and our military equipment to go fight it. So reject this myth that they've been selling you, that somebody had a cup of coffee stint at the UN and then makes eight million bucks after, has real foreign policy experience. It takes an outsider to see this look at a blank expression. She doesn't know the names of the provinces that she wants to ask. It's me doing by the numbers. But, Let me just say something here. You know, his reasonable peace deal in Ukraine, he made it clear. Give them all the land they've already stolen. Promise Putin you'll never put Ukraine in Russia. And then trust Putin not to have a relationship with China. Let me tell you something. That's no that's reasonable. That's not my deal. That's, that's not my deal. Yes, it's exactly what I'll, you said. I'll you my do deal this too. at every debate. I'll, just, I'll tell you, you exactly what no, I'll Don't I'll interrupt me. I didn't deals. interrupt you. Okay? You tell say this. How you you do this. At, to die. You go do this at every debate. You go out on the stump and you say something. All of us see it on video. We confront you on the debate stage. You say you didn't say it, and then you back away. And I want to I'll say tell you what? exactly no, what I, I said, Chris. I'm not I'm done yet. Well, this is now look. Hold this on. is and now this is not a spew. This is not a spew nonsense. Let me tell you something. This is the fourth debate. The fourth debate that you would be voted in the first 20 minutes as the most obnoxious blowhard in America. So <laughs> shut up for a while. I'm gonna, I'm gonna respond to that. I want to say something else. We're now 25 minutes into this debate, and he has insulted Nikki Haley's basic intelligence. Yeah. Not her positions, her basic intelligence. She doesn't know regions. She wouldn't be able to find something on a map that his three year old could find. Look, if you want to disagree on issues, that's fine. And Nikki and I disagree on some issues. But I'll tell you this, I've known her for 12 years, which is longer than he's even started to vote in a Republican primary. <laughs> and while we disagree about some issues and we disagree about who should be president of the United States, what we don't disagree on is this is a smart, accomplished woman and you should stop insulting so her. So I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna take several times over. So first of all, I think we just learned something from Chris Christie. We hold learned on, three on, things. Let, we ahead. learned three things right there. First of all, Chris Christie also doesn't know what provinces in eastern Ukraine he actually wants us to fight for. Chris, your version of foreign policy experience was closing a bridge from New Jersey to New York. Yeah. So do everybody a favor. Just walk yourself off that stage, enjoy a nice meal, yeah. and get the hell out of this yeah, race. Uh, when it comes to Nikki, I think if you're going to actually send your sons and daughters well, to go well, die you in somebody else's uh, well, Excuse me, Chris, I'm speaking, and I'm not done yet. I you had your chance, time when you and we're going to be done. So listen up to this. Is If these people want to send your sons and daughters to go die in Ukraine, they've been arguing for it for a year. $200 billion of our taxpayer money sent over. Neither of them could even name for you the provinces that they actually want to protect. And this is the people who have been touting their so-called foreign policy experience. It is intellectual fraud. These people are lying to you, the same people who told you about weapons and mass destruction in Iraq mm. to justify that invasion, didn't know the first thing about it, yet they sent thousands of our sons and daughters to go die. The same people who told you the same in Afghanistan, where the Taliban is still in charge 20 years later. Mm. Seven trillion of our national debt due to these toxic neocons. You can put lipstick on a Dick Cheney, it is still a fascist neocon. Thank and you, you Mr. Ramaswamy. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. Dick Cheney all over again in this okay. party. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. Yeah. 15 seconds. Yeah. Name the provinces. Neither of you could even name the provinces. Let me just think about these provinces. I think we've had enough of this. Let me think about that. There you go. She didn't name them. Crimea is the wrong wrong answer. All right. The floor is Christie's. All right. Let me just say this. You know, this is the kind of thing where he talks about experience. You know, I was the U.S. attorney in New Jersey when the terrorist attacks were launched against the United States in 2001. I brought the two, first two cases in this country against terrorists who tried to attack us again. And I know about the threat of terrorism and bullying in this country and around the world. And at that time, he was learning about the provinces in Ukraine, sitting with his smart ass mouth at Harvard. That's what was going on.
And so uh, the fact of the matter is, and back then he was a Democrat. Democrat. So, you know, the a, fact, the a, fact a is, the fact is that all he knows how to do, well, you're busy hugging all he Obama knows how to do, Thank you. all he knows how to do is insult to good people who have committed their lives to public service and not say anything that moves the ball down the field for the United States. Welcome back to the Republican primary debate live on News Nation from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We are now going to go to. There is no ad block of blocking probe yet. I can't do it. Full show immigration and the crisis are among the most pressing issues for Republican voters right now. Both the issue of migrants crossing illegally into our country and the separate issue of fentanyl being smuggled in mostly through legal ports of entry. All year, News Nation has been at the border documenting the crisis. In 2023 alone, Border Patrol encountered a record 2.4 million migrants. All four of you have talked tough. The question now is how realistic is the talk? So, Governor DeSantis, I'd like to start with you. You mm, have pledged to you send would. the military to the southern border on day one of your administration <laughs> he, he with orders certainly to shoot, did. quote, stone cold dead anyone illegally entering with a backpack that you believe contains fentanyl. <laughs> I still can't believe he said it. I, I'm, I'm going to send troops to the border and anyone trying to get in, I'm going to shoot them stone cold. I, isn't there like a process maybe we could go through before we go there? You know, uh, is it only if they're wearing backpacks, Ron? <laughs> like, what if there's what if you shoot them and there's no fentanyl in the backpack? What then? What then, Ron? So final. Critics have called this a shoot first, ask questions later <laughs> policy that yeah. would amount to extra judicial killing. You are a former yes. military lawyer. Why do you think this idea of yours would be legal? The drug cartels are invading our country and they are killing our citizens by the tens of thousands every year. Uh, we had a situation in Florida. There was an 18-month-old baby that was crawling on the floor of an AB Airbnb rental. It's time for fucking Jack and Ori with Ron DeSantis. I met an 18-month-year-old baby that was choking on fentanyl. Come on, hit, hit me oh, with it. There was fentanyl residue on the carpet, and mm -hmm. the baby died. Is this acceptable in this country? I know the <laughs> citation they don't needed. Care. They don't care that fentanyl is ravaging your community. They don't care that illegal aliens are, are ravaging our community and overwhelming our community. The commander in chief, not only when he when he said the baby died, he leaves out the part of the story that the baby was wearing a backpack. So <laughs> Ron had to fucking shoot it in the head. You have a responsibility to fight back against these people. And does so that mean gonna, shooting first? It means you're gonna you're gonna uh, categorize them as foreign terrorist organizations, uh, and we will identify just like we would anywhere. When I was in Iraq, the Iraq the the Al Qaeda wasn't wearing a uniform. You'd see anyone walking down the street, they all had man dresses on. You didn't know if someone had a, a bomb, an IED attached, or not. And so you had to make a... <laughs> fucking man dresses? Bruh, what the fuck? Where did you serve? <laughs> yeah, I was on the, uh, I was on the front lines of the transvestite wars. <laughs> What is he fucking talking about? Oh my god. Yeah, I got 69 confirmed uh, fanboy kills. Uh, I can't handle this. This debate's a shit show. It's a fucking nightmare, bro. Judgment based on intelligence, based on positive identification. But we're going to be able to get the intelligence on these cartel people. And here's the thing. If we had a wall across the southern border, which I support, this would not have happened. We need to build a wall across the southern border. I'll get it done, and I'll make four. I'll, Mexico is supposed to Man be four. Remember, here's how you do that. I am going to have fees on remittances from foreign workers when they send the money back to foreign countries. We're going to tax it, and we're going to build the wall with that. So yes, you should have had that, but we don't have it. I'm going to build it, but we have to lean in on this problem. I am not going to sit there and allow mothers to lose more kids because of fentanyl overdose. I am not going to sit there and let sex trafficking go unabated or Thank human you. trafficking go unabated. There's going to be a new sheriff in town, and these drug cartels <laughs> better buckle up. I'm not going to let man dresses be worn. Catch 
and deport all migrants who are here in this country illegally. But then you said in Londonderry, New Hampshire, last month that you will not deport those who are working and paying taxes rather than feeding off the system. Which is it? So first of all, what I said is all of the seven or eight million illegals that have come under Biden's watch absolutely have to go back. We have to stop the incentive of what's bringing them over here in the first place. Biden just gave temporary protective status to 500,000 Venezuelans. That's a half a million social security cards. That's a half a million driver's licenses. And I know from my time at the United Nations, the first thing they do is pick up the phone and said, we came over, come on over. And that's what sends more. You have to go and deport these people so they know it. Jesus, <laughs> this is a bit fucking much, Mickey. The first thing they do is call up the phone. Oh, yeah, you... I don't, I don't know about that, Nikki. That's a bit much, bit strong. That one sounds a bit bigoted, but you know, all right. It can't happen again. For those that have been here longer than that, we've got to start seeing who is it, how long have they been here, have they been vetted, have they paid taxes, have they been working, and figure out who else is out there. But what I know is my parents came here legally. They put in the time, they put in the price, they are offended by those that are coming illegally. We can't let them skip the line. But when you talk about fentanyl like you did before, let's look at something else. Yes, I think we should send special operations over and take out the cartels. I think we should Caution him. do a, re a remain in Mexico policy so they never step foot in U.S. soil in the first place. But look at where fentanyl came from. Let's go to the heart of the matter. It Let's. came from China. That's why we need to end all Didn't exist anywhere else ever. China until they stop murdering Americans with fentanyl. China. I promise you, they need our economy. They will immediately stop that. But this is where Trump went wrong. Trump was good on trade. But that's all he was with China, because here he allowed fentanyl to continue to come over. He continued to allow them to take, he would give them technology that would build up their military and hurt us. He allowed the Chinese infiltration for them to buy up farmland, to put money in our universities, and to continue to do things that were harmful for America. We now have a spy base Thank in you. Cuba and police stations, and Trump didn't do anything about it. Thank Her, you. China, though, I mean, this, this is... And to be fair, you know, Biden has allowed fentanyl to continue to come over, but, you know, only because Hunter wanted some, so it's rich because when she was governor of South Carolina, she was the number what one a... ranked governor of bringing the CCP into her state. She wrote a love letter to the Chinese ambassador saying how great a friend China is. You can look at it. We put it on our website, rondesantis.com. There's also a video of her as governor standing in front of a Chinese flag with a Chinese business saying that she now works for them, talking about this Chinese company. So she's been very weak on China. Now, here's the problem. The rhetoric is different, but the one one. Her donors, these Wall Street liberal donors, they make money in China. They are not going to let her be tough on China, and she will cave to the donors. She will not stand up for you. 15 seconds. First of all, he's mad because those Wall Street donors used to support him, and now they support me. The second thing is, he has a company, a Chinese company, UGAS, that he just did a rally there last year. They have given you 340,000 in campaign it's donations an American between company. them and their employees. They are tied to an the American Communist company. Chinese Thank Party. You. Jinko Solar is another yeah. one. They went and expanded. You gave two million in subsidies. I banned and they China from buying land in the state of and Florida. The Department of I Homeland ejected the Confucius Institute. Nikki Haley brought Confucius Institutes to the universities in South Carolina. That is not I true. ejected them. So I have a record of standing up and do what's right. And, and here's the you thing. You have a record she, of she's lying. Done, she's trying to say things like that. Even the liberal media groups that usually if I say the sky is blue, they'll fact check me and say that's wrong. They looked at her charges. They said it was totally false that they could not find one instance of me recruiting a Chinese business coming to Florida. You Thank know you. why? Because we never recruited any Chinese businesses to the state of Florida. Hell yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Over the past year, fentanyl has killed more than 75,000 Americans, 1,000 of them right here in Alabama. You have <laughs> right here in the audience this morning drug labs inside when Mexico, we gave it something to them. The president of Mexico said would be a hostile act. But fentanyl can easily be made anywhere, and labs that are shut yeah. down can <laughs> easily and quickly be replaced. Are your tough enforcement policies offering false hope to a country wracked by addiction? To the contrary, I don't think it's going to have to come to that if we deal with the actual demand side problem that we also have in this country. 
I mean, the easy part is talking about how we're going to use our military to secure the border. I will, and I believe that everybody else wants to do the same thing. But the harder part is dealing with the crisis of purpose and meaning, the mental health epidemic raging across this country like wildfire. And there's a reason <laughs> raging across that fight, stage <laughs> like wildfire. We, we are going to be sure to make sure we do it. This one is worse for many <clears> reasons. They're illegally lacing it into pharmaceuticals, so it's more dangerous. But we're deluding ourselves. The real false promise here is thinking that we're going to have dealt with that under underlying mental health epidemic in this country. No, and Vivek's right, right on this. With the demand side of it. Although but I want to get he back keeps to saying faith-based is going to help, from which, you know, Wuhan, fucked up. China, of all places, <laughs> drug materials that are going to the Mexican drug cartels that they're pumping across that southern border like a modern... Cheers, die. Love you, I think it's going to take a U.S. president that's going to have a very different conversation Yaki da. with Xi Jinping than what Joe Biden just had in California. I will tell Xi Jinping, you will not only not buy land in this country or donate to universities in this country, U.S. businesses won't expand into the Chinese market until they're playing by the same set of rules. And the same country that's putting fentanyl into illegal pharmaceuticals in Mexico, it's no coincidence, is the exact same country that also unleashed hell on the world with the COVID-19 pandemic. We also have to hold them accountable with every financial lever that we have available. Thank that you. is what it actually means to stand with a spine. And you mark my words, if we're willing to stand with the spine, China will absolutely have to fold because they're in a tougher spot than we are. And then we're back to playing by the same set Thank of rules. Thank you, Mr. That's Wamaswamy. The answer. Thank you. Let's talk about the economy. Words, the they didn't know whether to applaud the word salad. The has always been part of the American dream. But Sounding good. Out of Against China, probably. Americans. This year, mortgage rates reached 30-year highs. Yep. Home prices have risen $190,000 over the past decade. Bidenomics. Is this the free market at work? Or should the federal government do something to make homes more affordable? Well, first of all, I mean, you're exactly right. My daughter just got married, and I saw how hard it was for her and her husband to buy a home. Right now, the average homeowner and then Boeing in America is 49 years <laughs> came old. along. You've got young people everywhere. That used to be the American dream, and now it's out of reach. But you look at what happened. You first of all look at what the Fed did. The Fed did a terrible job when they allowed all of that money to go through. You saw the Treasury bond rates go up. That affected mortgage rates. That affected automobile rates. That affected insurance rates. And so now we have a high interest rate. You've got a supply issue. Ask any builder. The supply issues have continued to build, be there, that's caused the rate to go up. And then you've got insurances that, that have gone up. And so what you have is a lot of younger people who, one, can't afford a home, but two, the banks aren't lending them any money. They've made the Correct. regulations <laughs> so hard that they don't want to give loans on mortgages anymore. So what we have to do is we have to open it up. We have to, one, grow our economy so that people have more money in their pockets. We've got to look at the supply chain and make sure that we are funneling that so that builders don't have to sit there and go overseas to find things. And then we need to make sure that we really stop paying down this debt, make sure that we stop the borrowing, stop the spending. I'll veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels because our kids are not going to forgive us for all the spending that happened. And as much as everybody wants to talk about how Donald Trump had a good economy, $9 trillion in debt he did just in four years. And we're all paying the price of that, including those mortgage prices. We're going to come back to President Trump, I promise. Governor DeSantis, the latest News Nation decision desk poll found that inflation tops the worries of American voters. 61% mm -hmm. say they're very concerned, and the working class is hardest hit. Economists say this was fueled by a glut of federal spending. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration has added $6 trillion to the national debt so far. Mm -hmm. But President Trump wasn't exactly a penny pincher. No. His administration added $7.8 trillion. Do Republicans, including President Trump, share the blame for inflation? And what concrete steps would a President DeSantis uh, take to help Americans make ends meet? The borrowing, printing, and spending of money was both parties in Washington, D.C. That's just a fact. These Republicans in Washington have spent. It's driven your prices higher, and it's driven your interest rates to the point where you can't afford. I met a, a young fella in Iowa. <laughs> he had graduated he college did. a couple years ago, and he's like, Governor, I don't have a chance. I'm gainfully employed. He's like, I have no chance to afford a home. And <laughs> look at him doing. Look at him doing an impression of a peasant. Oh, it's mental. Oh, gee golly, mister. I don't have a chance. I don't have a chance, mister. 
I can't get a place, mister. I'm just, uh, I'm just someone from Iowa. It's fucking insane. Start a family. That is taking the American dream away from people. So we're going to get the inflation down. We're going to get the interest rates down. We are going to reduce spending, and I will be willing to veto, and I vetoed a lot as governor of Florida, and we'll do that. We're also going to open up all of our domestic energy for production. Lower your gas prices. Lower the price of fuel. That's going to help the economy. It also help jobs, and we'll do it. But, you know, another thing that's burdening young people are these student loans. Now, I don't support having a truck driver having to pay a student loan for someone that got a degree in gender studies. That is wrong. We should not have taxpayers do that. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to get to the root cause of the problem. These student loans are going to be backed by the universities because they need to have an incentive to produce gainful employment for people. They should not be indulging yeah. in ideological studies. They should be focusing on things I mean, that work. And we're going to take they some should of still offer those, and we're going to move it to actual vocational training. In Florida, we doubled apprenticeships. We have more truck drivers. These are in-demand skills. Don't let anybody tell you that the only way you can be successful is through a four-year brick and ivy degree. That's one way you can be. It's not the only way. And we're going to fix that problem in the United States of America. All right, fair enough. I like that, Ron. Teenage Mr. Ramaswamy, you pra praise cryptocurrency like Bitcoin as an opt-out from our, quote, broken financial architecture and you oppose uh -oh. efforts he's a crypto it. bro oh and no the largest international crypto Watch exchange out. just pleaded guilty to allowing his platform to launder money for terrorists including hamas you say your <laughs> cryptocurrency plan will quote ensure economic freedom for americans end quote won't it also ensure economic freedom for fraudsters criminals and terrorists look fraudsters criminal imagine if he just says now like listen Hoddle. <laughs> Just my views on crypto are very clear. Hoddle. Buy the dip to the moon. <laughs> Criminals and terrorists have been defrauding people for a long time. Our regulations I'm asked to the moon. With the current moment. The fact that SBF was able to do what he did at FTX shows that whatever they have as the current framework isn't working. And I think it is nothing short of embarrassing that Gary Gensler, the current leader of the SEC in front of Congress could not even say whether Ethereum counted as a regulated security or not. And so I think that this is just another example of the administrative state gone too far. Here's the dirty little secret in American politics today. The people who we elect to run the government are not the ones who are even actually running the government. It is the bureaucrats in those three-letter agencies that are writing regulations that Congress never gave them the authority to write. And the good news is mm. a U.S. president can absolutely fix that. That takes a U.S. president with a spine. So what I've said is in my administration, by the end of year one, we will have a 75% reduction in the number of federal bureaucrats. We will shut down government agencies that should not exist. We will rescind any regulation that fails the test of West Virginia versus EPA, which is the most important Supreme Court case of our lifetime, that said if Congress didn't delegate that to an administrative agency, then it's unconstitutional. These are seismic changes. These are big changes that the next president can deliver without asking Congress for permission or for forgiveness. And I want people to understand that distinction because people have been sold myths by politicians for a long time saying, I'm going to work with Congress to do this or that. Much of what you've heard on the stage from the other politicians fit that description, they need Congress. The things that I'm promising you, this is what the leader of the executive branch gets to do under Article 2 of the Constitution. Thank you, sir. Cut down the bureaucracy, well, that's that's a thing. grow you, our economy, and put the Federal Reserve in its place. This is part of the crypto no, no. discussion. No, no, no. 90 Mr. percent Ramaswamy, headcount reduction at the you're, Fed. You're out of time. But, 15 but, seconds, Governor DeSantis. So one, one of the dangers that we're going to face, Biden wants, is a central bank digital currency. They want to get rid of cash, crypto. They want to force you to do that. They'll take away your privacy. They will absolutely regulate your purchases. On day one as president, we take the idea of central bank digital currency and we throw it in the trash can it'll be dead on arrival for at least four years <laughs> and then who knows and when we come back we got a big subject huge you might even say donald trump uh-oh now we'll get to this in a moment but you may notice that the penguin from batman is uh is walking towards the stage it's not the penguin from batman uh it's just we really zoomed out it's actually uh chris christie and as i'll show you at the end 
He was so fucking pissed off. Because, like, did you even... Did you remember he was there? <laughs> He's had fuck all airtime. And he went fucking mental with Megyn Kelly. Uh, demanding more questions. So, Chris Crispy Cream. That's fucking... <laughs> Chris Crispy. But anyway, yeah, they just fucking absolutely wrecked him. So um, there's a, there was a clip where uh, Megyn Kelly talked about that afterwards. Apparently, he, he did go fucking mental. So just something, to, just something to pay attention to as we probably get hit with another ad. Wonder what this one will be. Welcome back, everyone. So you've all spent a lot of time criticizing each other on this stage, as Governor Christie pointed out, and less so for most of you on the front runner in this race, Donald Trump. Uh, we invited him to come tonight, as you know, but he declined to come. Uh, just to answer that question from Oxytech in the chat, why do you think they skipped him so much? The, the debates are a weird thing because you might think, <laughs> you, you won't if you ever listen to me or just, I don't know, formed your own opinion on American politics for even 30 seconds. You might think it's like, it's it's a, a, when you hear the word debate, it's why I always used to criticize the YouTube debates, the Twitch debate, a sphere. you might think a debate is um, experts being given equal time to argue contentious issues where a moderator ensures good timekeeping and that everyone gets to put their opinions across. But that's not what debates are. We've let the concept of debate devolve into it's a free-for-all where belligerent morons shout at each other, saying things that they their their fans, their base, their supporters already agree with. Then <laughs> I clapped, I clapped, I did. And you just do that, and then everyone is utterly convinced they won. But when you then apply it to the TV, they're all trying to generate viral moments. And so if you have a candidate that isn't box office, isn't trending well, isn't polling well, you don't give them more airtime. In fact, if you want to go back, Andrew Yang, uh, someone I have a lot of respect for, actually. Uh, we were very much Yang gang in my house. One, uh, and um, I, even, I even got connected to Andrew Yang's press liaison. And I really wanted... I still do. I still want to talk to him about the forward party. But people probably... You won't remember this. And if you go back and look at my earlier political coverage, you can see that what I'm saying is accurate. They cut his mic off in the debate. He wasn't polling enough to be listened to. And he had a very unique value proposition that wasn't necessarily popular with the universal basic income idea, i.e. he would pay everyone whatever the fuck it was a month, like $3,000 a month. And he believed societally it would actually save money, not cost us money. And CNN and MSNBC and, you know, even people who are meant to be on his side because he's ostensibly a Democrat, they did some unbelievable fucky stuff. They literally turned his mic off. So he couldn't even speak up in the way you've seen. They took a different American Asian person's picture and used that instead of his image. So, you, you know, they used someone else's face. And whenever he brought these things up, they were really dismissive. And they pushed him, uh, you know, they, they, they were trying to imply he was making these things up. Now, the way that this broken, corrupt political system in America works, he was rewarded with a one-year contract for not kicking up El Big Stinkerino and still towing some sort of party line. He got a one-year CNN punditry deal. And if you remember, he was a political talking head on CNN for about 12 months. And then he left, and now he's made something called the Forward Party. And so this is the way the game is played, unfortunately. And so when you're on a TV network debate, they're not giving you equal time because it's not. It, it makes no sense for them to do it. You know, all the memes about Bergmentum and all that stuff, you're not giving him equal time with everyone else. He has no chance, no shot, uh, as you might say, if for real, for real. So you don't give Chris Christie equal time at DeSantis or Nikki Haley or even Vivek because they're the people that are going to produce the viral moments that make your news network trend, that get shared, 
And so, yeah, Chris Christie got put out to pasture. That's how it works. That's how the game is played, unfortunately. And, um, you know, it, it's not as abundantly clear. I will add this time around the GOP primaries. I think by and large, we got the fucking also runs out pretty quickly. But Chris Christie is the next in line to drop. And this debate is certainly nudging him towards that. I get why he's angry. But how many times can this motherfucker say Trump is bad? Like, that's the problem. It's like, yeah, we get it, you know? So that's why. That's what's going on there. But we'd like to ask you a couple questions about him. Former President Trump recently promised, if he's reelected, to bring back and expand his program restricting immigration from Muslim countries. Here he is in Iowa on October 16th. No longer will we allow dangerous lunatics. Now, by the way, Donald Trump is banned from Twitch, so uh, invoking the Dr. Disrespect clause of Twitch, my account now, my, uh, my stream now needs to be banned, unfortunately. <laughs> but by the way, I do want to just add, um, if anybody thinks that maybe these legal problems and all of that stuff uh, isn't taking uh, its toll on Donald Trump, Look at the fucking state of this guy. And I've tried to explain this to even Trump supporters. Trump isn't the same Trump. Is he smarter than Biden? Is he still more there than Biden at 77? Yes, he is. But, like, he is tired, exhausted. If you listen to his speeches, he's made a bunch of mistakes and errors. He's referred to Joe Biden as Barack Obama on a few occasions. Which, by the way, spoiler... If, if that might be more accurate than you know um <laughs> but anyway he's absolutely fucked and uh they brought trump to the table in this debate i mean look at the fucking clip on it and then just listen to this haters bigots and maniacs to get residency in our country we're not going to let them stay here if you empathize with radical islamic terrorists and extremists you're disqualified you're just disqualified Ambassador Haley, do you support President Trump's plan for ideology? You're just disqualified. Well, I don't just think disqualified. that a straight-up Muslim ban as much as you look at the countries that have terrorist activity that want to hurt Americans. You do, you can ban those people from those countries. That's the way we should look at it, is which countries are a threat to us. You look at what came across the southern border. What worries me the most are those that came from Iran, from Yemen, from Lebanon. Those areas where they say death to America. That's where... You Case to case basis. By the way, what Nikki Haley uh, seems unaware of is about 95% of the world says that to America. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe a blanket anti death to America policy is not really going to. They say it, they don't necessarily mean it, you know, but it. <laughs> You have to sort of look at it through the lens of your foreign policy of the last 100 years, which, <laughs> yeah, and exactly. And by the way, I don't know if you've seen the people marching through New York by way of a, for instance, pretty sure about like, wait, do you hear what I hear? It's death to America chance in America by Americans. So I don't know. I don't know, Nikki, maybe chill the fuck out on that one. Let's just, let's just have a functional immigration system where you apply to get in or you have a valid reason, you think, to go to the board and say, hey, look, you know, I want asylum, I'm doing this, I'm fleeing that. We process them, we make a decision. Nobody has to sit in a cage. <laughs> let's build some non-cages, you know. But just saying we're going to ban a country because it's a threat to America, I mean, shit. you got some real problems with that one. It's not about a religion. It's about a fact that certain countries are dangerous and are threats to us. A president has one job, and that's to keep Americans safe. And that's what we've got to do is make sure that we have good national security in that process. And that's the way you should look at it, is where the terrorist threats are, how we're going to deal with it, and what we're doing about it. And the biggest threat we have right now is communist China. But you have to also look at what Iran and Russia are doing as well. Number of terrorist attacks <laughs> perpetrated against America from communist China. <laughs> so I don't know. But she... Nikki knows. She's got it. She's nailed it. Well, and we need to be paying attention to that. That's why we have to focus on things like cyber, on space, on artificial... On cyber, space. And not just the regular things that we've always focused on.
It's not just cyber terrorism, though. That's important. But look what's happened in Europe. You have more anti-Semitism in Germany than at any time since Adolf Hitler. Why? Because they imported mass numbers of people who reject their culture. Europe is committing suicide with the mass migration. And uh -oh. it's illegal and legal. Uh, Nikki Haley said the other day there should be no limits on, on legal immigration and that corporate CEOs should set the That's policy on that. Quit there lying. needs to be Thanks, Lucas. immigration. Thanks, Lucas. Love to you too. Happy holidays. People from cultures that are you too, Kev, so, see example, you in the chat. I said with the Gaza, you had some of the, the, the squad wanted to import 300,000 people from the Gaza Strip. I said, no, we're not taking anyone from Gaza because of the anti-Semitism and because they reject American culture. So we've got to get smart about this. Don't know, actually. Probably a good way to ingratiate yourself to people from Gaza will be to offer them aid and clemency in a time when your international ally is bombing the shit out of everyone. Uh, because the political party they elected uh, has sort of uh, put innocent civilians between them and their terrorist organization. And I'm not saying those people do like Jews. <laughs> I don't know. I'd have, to, I'd have to meet everyone, make a determination based on their personality. But, you know, might help if you actually took some people in, offered them some aid. Help them out instead of saying no, you can't come in. But 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 you're funding you're funding Israel, yeah, and you can't come in neither. Uh, oh, okay, cool, cool. We're just stuck in the middle, I guess. Wicked. We cannot let the United States be like Europe. So there's, 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 Governor Christie. Yeah. If I may just hit this point because uh, it relates to what they just said. Higher life expectancy, higher literacy rates. What a nightmare. About amongst the professional politicians in this race. What about all of the illegals who are already here? Here's mm. the answer. Here's There's the answer. 287 G in the law. That is a provision that mm. already allows ICE agents to deputize or allow local. You might know 287 G. Used to stream with Summit. <laughs> 287 G. Law enforcement to enforce those ICE wars. <coughs> and it shocks me that nobody in the Republican Party is talking about it because there are one million then officials, law enforcement officials in this country. And against that backdrop, we absolutely have the ability to Thank deport you. anybody who's in this country illegally. Thank you, we Mr. Need to be Ramaswamy. talking about more in this, in Thank this country. Thank you. Governor Christie. <laughs> actually did that as governor of South Carolina. Governor Christie asked last night oh, in Iowa Proudly. that he would be a dictator if he wins a second term in office. Donald uh -oh. Trump whipped no, quote, except for day one, promising to seal the southern border. He has also pledged to begin the largest deportation operation in American history, saying that migrants are, quote, poisoning the blood of our country. Mm. He has pledged to round up and expel an estimated 11 million. Un By the way, you can imagine how that poisoning the blood speech fucking went over. They literally said, this is no joke, they said this in the media. Um, they immediately, he did say that, yes. Uh, he, listen. I'm, I'm going to just say this. I definitely think I'm intelligent enough to, if I was a Donald Trump campaign person, I would go, maybe don't bring up blood, the word blood. <laughs> There's a lot of negative connotations politically when you start talking about blood. Just don't, bl don't bring up the word blood because it's got links to all that other stuff. So don't. But when he said illegal immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country... Uh, and he did say illegal, he didn't say immigrants. The media reported it as him saying all immigrants did. What they immediately did was they went through the copies of Mein Kampf and then they found quotes of Adolf Hitler saying, you know, the group he didn't like um, are literally weakening the blood lines of his non-existent theorized Aryan super race and they compared the two things and said these are the same and uh, in fact so bad uh, Biden's uh, campaign R let me see if I can find you the image because again I know you guys think oh he's making it up or he's making apologies for Trump right now or whatever no it's not that I, I just want to show you how hysterical it got. Biden-Harris HQ, which is a pack for, obviously, the Biden uh, re-election campaign. After hearing uh, poisoning the blood, and again, listen, 
I'm not saying I agree with that sentiment. It was about illegal immigrants. I wouldn't use that phraseology whatsoever. Don't agree with it. Trump is a maniac. I'm not saying otherwise. Uh, what he wasn't saying was immigrants, <laughs> right? All immigrants are poisoning the bloodlines of American people. So what I'm saying is invoking Hitler in this instance and saying it's the same thing is ridiculous. I want to be absolutely clear. All right, here we go. This was published by the Biden Pack. Uh, and again, apologies to Twitch <laughs> if, uh, you know, because obviously Adolf Hitler isn't banned on Twitch, but Trump is. Uh, so uh, this was the graphic they put out. Trump parrots Hitler. He said, we will root out my political opponent. And you, you will you will notice that they use quotes uh, around and, and then they add words Trump didn't say. As it goes, we will root out my political opponents that live like vermin within our country and so you can see the bits where the quotes are what he said people that were misusing their political power to target him were vermin he did say that but he didn't say the rest of the sentence and then jews are vermin and pests that must be exterminated obviously adolf hitler said that then immigrants are poisoning the blood of our country he didn't say immigrants he said illegal immigrants poisoning the blood of the country, and then he went on to talk about they're filling up, what was it, jails and asylums, and then he talked about fentanyl. It was like some insane rambling speech in New... I think it was New Hampshire he was campaigning. Um, and then contamination of the blood by an inferior race will lead to the fall of Germany. That's what Hitler said. So they're comparing those two statements, and those two statements are in no way comparable. And listen, I can condemn Trump's rhetoric and simultaneously say those two statements are in no way comparable, and you should also, if you're intellectually honest, uh, do the same. And then he said, my political opponents within our country are far worse than the dictators of Russia and North Korea. And again, they've added some things there. But when asked, you know, if he thought biden's administration was a dictatorship he said oh no they're far worse far far worse uh and then to as again one last desperate reach they said we must all recognize the greater inner enemy within germany which again was part of adolf hitler's anti-semitic anti-jew pre-holocaust rhetoric so i don't know how in good conscience you can put this out into Again, sorry, I'm you. You know the the political waters, right? And you can put that out there and think that's reasonable and fair when these aren't even accurate quotes. But that is indeed what happened. So just so you're all up to date. Undocumented immigrants in the United States. What do you make of that plan? <laughs> I think it's completely predictable. I mean, look, he's made it very clear. There's no mystery to what he wants to do. He started off his campaign by saying, I am your retribution. <laughs> Eight years ago, he, he did said, I am your voice. This is an angry, bitter man who now wants to be back. In my own writing about Trump's campaign, I've said Trump's political campaign is equivalent to the script of Death Wish, <laughs> the movie. <laughs> and if you don't know what that is, Charles Bronson is what uh, might be his wife in the first movie. Uh, I think his wife gets raped and murdered by a pack of, like, uh, some gang, some pack of, like, I don't know, hoods in the street. The classic 80s New York toughs with the fucking sleeveless shirts, you know, pack of bikers or whatever. And he goes on a, he goes on a fucking, you know, revenge mission where he kills them all. Then they, they did it to another family member in Death Wish 2. And then in Death Wish 3, he'd ran out of family members, so they killed his best friends. <laughs> and then Death Wish 3 is the best of them, probably. That's actually hilarious. But anyway, I said, Trump's political camp, he's telling you what he's going to do. He's saying, if you re-elect me, I'm, I'm, I'm a fuck everybody. Like, I'm not going to do anything for you. I'm not going to do anything for you. No, 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 I've got my own. I just want to settle the score, get my second term, and I will absolutely settle the score. And it's like, well... I don't know, guys. Maybe don't let the guy say in that. Just a thought. Back as president because he wants to exact retribution on anyone who has disagreed with him, anyone who has tried to hold him to account for his own conduct. And every one of these policies that he's talking about are about pursuing a plan of retribution. And yet, at the first debate, my three colleagues on this stage, when asked if he would be convicted of federal felonies, 
Would they still support him, raise their hand, look into the camera, and let everybody know that they would still support him, even if convicted of federal felonies? Federal felonies, by the way. Which federal this is the only area I would say Christie really has the process, far superior moral high ground compared to everyone else in the race. You shouldn't be supporting felons going for political office. You know? others to commit crimes. Folks who are now agreeing to go to jail because of what they did in his name. So do I think he was kidding when he said he was a dictator? All you have to do is look at the history. And that's why failing to speak out against him, making excuses for him, pretending that somehow he's a victim, empowers him. You want to know why those poll numbers are where they are? Because folks like these three guys on the stage make it seem like his conduct is acceptable. Let me make it clear. His conduct is unacceptable. He's unfit. And be careful of what you're going to get. If you ever got another Donald Trump term, he's letting you know, I am your retribution. Thank he will you. only be, Elizabeth, he will only be his own retribution. He doesn't care for the American people. It's Donald Trump first. Thank you, Governor Christie. Governor DeSantis. Governor DeSantis. People didn't like Thank it. You. Thank Booze. You. Governor DeSantis, Donald Trump would be older on day one of his second presidency than Joe Biden was on day one of his first. You have said Trump is not the same man he was when he ran in 2016. Your campaign is running ads showing Trump confused. And yeah, you true. Have said he has, quote, true. lost the zip on his fastball. You seem to be saying Donald Trump is no longer mentally fit to be president. Is that what you think? Look, he, he is showing, father time is undefeated. The idea that we're going to put someone up there that's almost 80 and there's going to be no effects from that, we all know Tell that's him. not true. Uh, and so we have an opportunity to do a next generation of leaders and really be able to move, move this country forward. We also need a president that can serve two terms. Uh, I don't think Donald Trump, I think he's going to have, a, I don't think he'd be, be able to get elected. The Democrats want him to be the nominee. We see that. They are going to turn the screws the minute if he got the nomination. But do you think he's mentally fit to be I, president? I think we need to have somebody younger. I think when you get up to 80, I don't think it's a job for that. But let me just respond to some of the things there. Look, uh, the media is making a big deal about what he said about some of these comments. I would just remind people uh, that is not how he governed. He didn't even fire Dr. Fauci. He didn't fire Christopher Wray. He didn't clean up the swamp. He said he was going to drain it. He did not drain it. He said he was going to build the wall and have Mexico pay for it. We don't have the wall. Uh, he did say in 2016 he'd have the largest deportation program in history. He deported less than Barack Obama did when Barack Obama was president. So some of the some of these policies he ran on in 16, I was cheering him on then, but he didn't deliver it. Here's what I can promise people. 100% of the things I promised as governor I delivered on those promises. I beat the left time and time again, and that's what I'll do for you as president. We got to start winning again as a party. Yes, win the election, but we've got to start getting these issues. I will go in and wreak havoc on this bureaucracy. You will see people fired, and we are going to bring a reckoning for how this government here's, handled listen, here's COVID-19. What, here's here's what, what here's what oh, he's, he's pulling the mic up. Look at, look at Vivek. They've turned him down. The question was very direct. Is he fit to be president or isn't he? The rest of the speech is interesting, but completely non-responsive. And if we were in a courtroom, they'd strike the answer and say, Governor DeSantis, no, they you're, a smart, they would say that you're a smart they would argue man. That the, no, they would. No, they wouldn't, They would Chris. strike the answer no, because you're not answering you it. Is he fit? Like, you is have he your, fit? You have no. your thing. Is he you fit or isn't he? Thing. No, I don't have my thing. We don't, He's the thing. Is we he do fit or isn't he? Do do you're talking that's about him being 80, 80 years old. It doesn't mean that somebody is he couldn't fit? get elected. That's Ron, the people that Governor DeSantis, let him have a question. Governor DeSantis, let him have a question. Ron, I think we have an opportunity to do somebody who is in the primary. Right. Yes. We don't have to no worry talking. about all this stuff with Ron. confidence. Stop. We can get it done, Stop. we'll do it. I'm going to come to you. Finish. Look, father time is undefeated. I don't know how he would score on a, on a test, but I know this. We have an opportunity to nominate someone and elect someone for two terms who's going to be spitting nails on day one and for eight years so deliver you, you think he's big fit. result. You we should think. not nominate somebody he won't who's, answer. Who's, who's almost 80 years old. Okay. He's afraid to answer. <laughs> no, I'm not. He's, no, you have to no. either, either you're afraid or you're not listening. No, it's not. There's a simple you don't, you don't question. Want to hear the is he fit? Is he fit? Hey, 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 no one can hear this. No one can hear you. They can't hear you. You finish and then you get it back. All right. You know, look, I'm a simple guy. Okay? I hear the question. And I answer it. Is he fit or isn't he? 
I'll concede you're fit, Ron. You're a new generation. You're 44 <laughs> years old. I wish I was still 44 years old. Okay? 45. So, well, congratulations. I still take 45. Is he fit or isn't he? And this is the problem with my three colleagues. They're afraid to offend. And See, let I me wanna, tell you I wanna, something. I wanna, I wanna if you're afraid, afraid on, if you're afraid to Christie's absolutely on the money here as well. Um, a lot of these people in the back of their minds particularly Vivek, but it applies to Ron, it applies to Nikki, is if we're second place and the GOP does nominate Trump, can I be the Veep? Can I be on that ticket and be the vice president? And they will fucking absolutely 100% take it. Oh, and by the way, anyone who thinks Chris Christie's 230 pounds out of their mind, I'm like 256 <laughs> for context. I mean, I've just had Christmas, but it, it's I am getting swole in all the wrong ways. But uh, yeah, that's 280, 290. I'm just letting you know. But you know, listen, he'd, he'd fucking, he'd love that. He'd, he'd, he'd love to be called 230. Anyway, all of these people are wondering if Trump gets a nomination, can I be the Veep? Now, unfortunate, oh, well, it's not even unfortunate because it wouldn't make any difference. Trump has particularly stung Ron. He calls him Ron de Sanctimonious. He's given him that nickname, which is, you know, base is really into. And that won't mean anything if Trump does get the nomination. He could still go with Ron DeSantis. A lot of people might think, actually, Ron DeSantis might be a good veep to keep him within his guardrails. That was the whole theory behind Mike Pence. Well, Mike Pence was the vice president, and we all know how that went down, and now Trump world hates him, and the Republican Party's essentially pensioned him off. As I said, there was reporting in this post-debate landscape that Trump was considering Nikki Haley as veep. I don't think there's any way that's true, but maybe i just don't see it vivek's entire campaign has been i can't win but if i suck trump's mushroom tip enough can i get the veep out of nowhere and he is very much auditioning for that which is why he's always performatively pardoned on day one i wouldn't do anything no 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 chris christie is the only guy saying actually trump is so, some sort of aberration to american politics that we shouldn't be you know F f um, by the way, I'm, I am basing the mushroom thing on the uh, Stormy Daniels case, if you want to go look it up. She said his penis looked like Toad from uh, the Mario games. <laughs> it's actually true. So anyway, Chris Christie. <laughs> That's true. Guys, I told you, I'm, I I'm terminally online in a way you will never understand. Chris Christie is the only guy that uh, is uh, sort of saying Trump's an aberration to politics. I'm the only one who's going to call him out. Now, Chris Christie can't win and certainly can't be Veep. His entire campaign has essentially been, as you know, I described him in one of my articles as he's the ghost of Marley in A Christmas Carol. He's there rattling his chains. Ooh, Ebenezer, Ebenezer, change your ways. And that's, he, he's trying to be the conscience of the Republican Party, despite the fact being the perfect illustration of America politics because he backed trump in 2016 and 2020 and it's only now in a post january 6 landscape that chris christie has decided to have a conscience about all of this stuff so you know that that's the game that's being played but at the very least uh at least chris christie is saying it on this stage while the rest are hedging their bets to offend donald trump then what are you going to do when you sit across from President Xi, you sit across from the Ayatollah, you sit across from Putin? You have to be willing to offend with the truth. Okay. And it's answer the question. Fit or unfit? Okay, listen, 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 I promised Ron DeSantis okay. a minute and it, not and a full a minute. minute. I've got a it second. It is not about offending. You can weigh in and then we're moving it's on. It's about pointing out, do you want to elect somebody who will be older than Biden was when he went in 2021? I, I don't think he was he's as bad as Biden was at all. But I do think that over a four year period, it is not a job for somebody that's pushing 80. We need somebody that's younger. We need somebody that's going to be able to go in there and clean house okay. on day one so he, and do it for two terms. And I'll be able to here's do my that. issue with all three of my other colleagues on this debate stage. Yes, Vivek. Is all three of them have been licking Donald Trump's boots for years for money and endorsements. Ron DeSantis, you've been a great governor, but you would have never been one without actually begging Donald Trump for that endorsement. And you attacked Same thing him for in your Nikki book Haley. a year ago. Same thing with Chris Christie. As a 
lobbyist begging them for COVID money for his special interests in New Jersey, prepping him for the debates last time around. <laughs> These people are now Monday morning quarterbacking some decision he made. I think the real enemy is not Donald Trump. It's not even Joe Biden. It is the deep state that at least Donald Trump attempted to take on. And if you want somebody who's going to speak truth to power, then vote for somebody who's going to speak the truth to you. Why am I the only person on the stage, at least, who can say that January 6th now does look like it was an inside job? That the government lied to us for 20 years about Saudi Arabia's involvement in 9-11? That the great replacement theory is not some grand right-wing conspiracy theory? but a basic statement of the Democratic Party's platform, that the 2020 election was indeed stolen by big tech, that the 2016 election, the one that Trump won for sure, was also one that was stolen from him by the national security establishment. <laughs> okay. That actually thank you. Okay, 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 thank you, thank you. <laughs> That's enough of that. There's a reason why That's enough of that. That'll do it, sir. That'll do it, sir. It's going to take not people who were licking his boots one time and now Monday okay. morning quarterback yep. okay. criticizing when it's convenient. Okay. Governor Christie. Um, I'm not going to show you the clip, although it should, but uh, Van Jones, who is a, uh, he poses as a political talking head on CNN when really he's just an actor. You know, CNN performs the news, it doesn't really deliver it. Anyway, Van Jones is the guy that did crocodile tears on the day that Joe Biden got elected and said, oh, it's, it's, it's like for all African Americans, it's like a great weight has been lifted from us. And it's like, okay, cool, you've elected a former segregationist. Segregationist. <laughs> well done. You know, gonna crunk about that. Yeah, gonna fucking. They were dancing in the streets electing Joe Biden and it, all these Democrat supporters. And it's like, probably if you want to call an American president fucking racist, uh, you know, Joe Biden was friends with segregationists. He tried to work things out with segregationists. Part of the busing program to help them. Joe Biden was one of the architects of a crime bill that specifically recognized the difference between powdered cocaine and crack cocaine, which, of course, crack cocaine was introduced wholesale into the hood. So, you know, for Van Jones to weep in supposed joy, the fact that they elected Joe Biden, and as I said, I took pictures of people dancing in the streets. Uh, it's like you actually elected a guy that's done more, you know, has been involved in more destructive policy towards black Americans than, than Trump ever had. Uh, ever had been but he cried on tv and uh, i wrote an article yeah it was called america home of the stunning and brave you know go read it after i wrote that article and published it again that was another day where i lost like 2000 subscribers people on twitter were calling me racist because i said van jones uh, fake cried and he did anyway after vivek said that Van Jones went and said, Vivek chilled me. I was shaking listening to that speech because what came out of his mouth was white supremacist rhetoric. Don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> I don't, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say Vivek's not a white supremacist. Just gonna say that. It's bold of me, I know. Again, you can look that up in your own time, but that's literally what happened as a result of him saying that, because he invoked the phrase Great Replacement uh, Theory. Now, I will say this. What he's talking about isn't the Great Replacement Theory. He's used a phraseology that has been co-opted, essentially. Uh, great Replacement Theory is, you know, this idea that liberal immigration policy is designed to sort of get rid of white people by and large what he's talking about is this notion that if you go soft on immigration you bring people in and then you allow them to naturalize and get citizenship they'll be more sympathetic to the party that let them in and they will vote that way for the rest of their lives and that's what i think vivek was talking about but anyway he said the words great replacement theory which is of course a, th a, a, a theory used by you know, a lot of white supremacist groups. Uh, so, you know, they stung him with it. That little speech there got Vivek absolutely crucified. Can you guess if one of these foods makes arthritis pain worse? Is it these tomatoes? Oh, wow, I'm in actually. Cucumbers? Am I watching this ad? Apples? I love quizzes. Bread? I'll give you the answer in just a second. 
One of these foods contains uh, a sinister protein. I reckon you're going to give me the answer in approximately 3 minutes and 34 seconds if you give me the answer at all. Oh, and I've got to know. It's bread, right? It's got to be bread. It's got to be bread. That once eaten makes its way down to your joints on the cellular level. And on a cellular level, he's the Terminator. It's Terminator Genesis. It, it replicates me on a cellular level. Kickstarts inflammation, swelling, and makes arthritis pain worse. It's not gluten. My name is Dr. Brian Paris. It's not gluten. And I'm the head researcher at Health and Wellness Tools. Look, man, he's got his name on a, on a white lab coat. You know he's important. Dot com. One of the world's leading organizations in the fight against arthritis. You'll learn the answer in this quick three minute video. Here's what happened when people like you with arthritis stopped eating this protein. I don't have arthritis. Who are you talking to, blood? I can't do it. I can't stick in there, guys. I'll find out later. I'll report back. On trans medical treatments for minors, saying it's a parental rights issue. The surgeries done on minors involve cutting off body parts at a time when these kids cannot even legally smoke a cigarette. Kids who go from puberty blockers to cross sex hormones are at a much greater likelihood of winding up sterile. How is it that you think a parent should be able to okay these surgeries, never mind the sterilization of a child? And aren't you way too out of step on this issue to be the Republican nominee? No, I'm not. Because, I, because Republicans believe in less government, not more. In less involvement with government, not more in government involvement in people's lives. And you know what, Megan? I trust parents. And we're out there saying that we should empower parents in education. We should empower parents to make more decisions about where their kids go to school. I agree. We should empower parents to be teaching the values that they believe in in their homes without the government telling them what those values should be. And yet we want to take other parental rights away. I'm sorry. As a father of four, I believe there is no one who loves my children more than me. There's no one who loves my children more than my wife. There's no one who cares more about their success and health in life than we do. Not some government bureaucrat, not some... You look at these jokers down in Congress. By the way, to all the people in the chat uh, that have been feeling down on themselves, you know, and maybe falling into the incel rabbit hole, Chris Christie's got four kids. What's your excuse? Just get out there, be normal, talk to people. Maintain good hygiene. It can happen for you. He's a beacon of hope. It takes them three weeks to pick a speaker. And up until two days ago, they couldn't promote somebody in the military in the United States Senate who earned their new rank. And we're going to put my children's health and my decisions in their hands for them to make those decisions, for Joe Biden to make those decisions, for me and for my wife. Let me just say this. This is not something I favor. I think it's a very, very dangerous thing to do. But that's my opinion as a parent, Megan. And I get to make the decisions about my children, not anybody else. And every parent out there who's watching tonight, you start to turn over just a little bit of this authority, the authority they're going to take from you next, you're not going to like. I'll stand up for parents each and every time. So there are laws you do banning not, you smoking do not have, or drinking by you do a not have the right. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The chaos. question for him. And you guys are going to get to weigh in, okay? Here's my follow-up question. You talk about parental rights. Let's talk about them. When you were governor in 2017, you signed a law that required new guidelines for schools dealing with transgender students. Those guidelines required schools to accept a child's preferred gender identity, even if the minor's parents objected. Not true. And it said that there is no duty for schools to notify parents if their son or daughter changes their gender identity, allowing this serious issue to remain a secret between the school and a child. No. How is any of that pro-parental rights? By the rights? way, that's simply not true. You're doing what you accuse me that's of, simply, Chris. It is absolutely that's true. That's simply not true. That's simply not true. That law was they massively turned up in X Men and regulated in 2018 before I after no, I was you out mandated of office. The Megan. No, it, no, we did not, Megan. We did not issue those guidelines, no. and you're wrong about that. Simply wrong. Look at Megan's face. I'm definitely not wrong about that. So I think if this uh, is one issue choice, that's disqualifying, on. it's this one. I, I stood up every single time for parents to be able to make the decisions for their minor children. But parents... Every single time, parents should make those decisions. And by the way, you know what? Every once in a while, parents are going to make decisions that we disagree with. But the minute you start to take those rights away from parents, 
You don't know that slippery slope, what rights are going to be taken away okay. next, and you what's going to be have, on As you. a parent, you do not have the right to abuse your kids. This is cutting off their genitals. This is mutilating these minors. These are irreversible procedures. Uh, and this is something that other countries in Europe, like Sweden, once they started doing it, they saw it did incalculable damage. They've shut it down. I signed legislation in Florida banning the mutilation of minors because it is wrong. We cannot allow this to happen in this country. And, and I know Chris disagrees with me, and I think he has an honest position. Uh, Nikki disagrees with me. She opposes the bill that we did to ban that. She said the law shouldn't get involved not. with it. <laughs> you said the law shouldn't get involved with it. She also, though, I think, and this is flows from what she did as governor of South Carolina, you know, they had a bill to try to say that men shouldn't go into girls' bathrooms. And she killed that bill, and she bragged that she killed that bill. Bill. Even to this day, she bragged that. I don't think men should be going into little girls' bathrooms. I think it's wrong. And I think what about going to islands? I, I, I am going to come to you. I, I promise seven seconds. Go quickly. I think the North Star here is transgenderism is a mental health disorder. We don't let you smoke a cigarette by the age of 18. We don't let you have an addictive drink of alcohol by the age of 21. And I just challenge Ron DeSantis to go one step further and support what I think is clearly within the authority to do using federal funds just like Reagan did in 84 for the Highway Act that said the minimum drinking age needs to be 21. We can do the same thing when it comes to banning genital mutilation or chemical castration. Okay. I know Ron's been okay. unclear about that on the federal Haley. level. I'm crystal clear. That's where I stand. Got and it. That's a mental health disorder. That's, that's where it. I need to be at. Go ahead. So first of all, Ron has continued to lie because he's losing. No, it's, it's not just, a lie. You are lying. You so said first it on of, tape. So first of all, I will say that when I was governor, 10 years ago when the bathroom situation came up, I said The bathroom a situation. American politics. And I said, we don't need to bring government into this, but boys go into boys' bathrooms, girls go into girls' bathrooms, and if anyone else has an issue they use a private bathroom now 10 years later we see that this issue has exploded and this shows how hypocritical ron continues to be love you too he was new one they asked him about that he said he didn't think bathroom bills were a good use of his time you can go look that up i signed a bathroom bill in florida so but that's obviously said, no. not true <laughs> The idea that you would say that I, I was signed against it, you that. didn't. You killed it. I signed it. I we stood didn't. up for little girls. You didn't do it. And there was this going on. I was actually just in South Carolina. Some of the legislators told me at the time there were boys going into the girls. That's the there whole reason not. why they no, did no, it. No, 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 no. And so they say when she does that explanation that that doesn't hold water. And this is the upstate of South Carolina. To be fair, Ron DeSantis did stand up. <laughs> he did stand up for little girls. This is his man. Really appropriate. Ron, I signed the bill. I protected the girl. Do you know girls. South Carolinians? She did not do, do you know it. I know South Carolinians? That. Because South Carolinians. Okay. South, no, no, no. You are not going to talk about my state like that because I will tell you for a fact, South Carolinians never allowed that to happen, and we hadn't. We did not have that issue at the time. What I have always said is, boys going to a boys' bathroom, girls going to a girls' bathroom. Just... But hold on one second. I also say that biological boys shouldn't be playing in girls' sports, and I will do everything I can to stop that because it's the women's issue of our time. Nice oh yeah, that that <laughs> that not the abortion stuff. Are you sure? Are you actually sure? Okay. When discussing your Hindu faith in September, you seem to take a uh -oh. shot at Ambassador Haley, who is also Indian American and who converted to Christianity as an adult. You said an easy thing for me to do, being a politician, is to they're going to monster you here like they did Obama. Be a Christian Careful, and run. make Vivek Vicky or whatever. End quote. Are you questioning Nikki Haley's Christian convictions? And why is your campaign made a point of referring to Ambassador Haley by her given first name, Nimarada? even though she's gone by Nikki for her whole life. Well, my whole deal is if Nikki Haley, of all people, should know how to pronounce my name correctly, the rest of the news media can learn it. My deal is I'll call her Nikki when she can say my own name right. That's our little fun side bet there. Here's what I will say is deeper. I don't question her faith, but I question her authenticity. And I think that's deeper here. We were just talking about the trans issue. This is a symptom of a deeper cancer in American life, identity politics. 
this new religion that says your race, your gender, and your sexuality are your identity. It is anti-American. It is meritocratic. It's anti-meritocratic, and it is dividing this country to a breaking point. And I've spoken about this to the left. My books are all about this. I've preached this to the left, but it's even worse when Republicans try to play the same game. We're talking about that trans issue. And Nikki Haley's campaign launch video sounded like a woke Dylan Mulvaney Bud Light ad talking about how she was kick in heels. At the first debate, she said that only a woman can get this job done. That's what she said. After the third debate, when I criticized Ronna McDaniel after five failed years of leadership of this party and criticized Nikki for her corrupt foreign dealings as a military contractor, she said that I have a woman problem. Nikki, I don't have a woman problem. You have a corruption problem. And I think that that's what people need to know. Nikki is corrupt. Uh-oh. This is a woman who... He's held, the the He's held up the sign. He's held up the sign, guys. What do smart chiropractors and doctors do when they get joint pain? See, Dunno. the second us chiropractors feel joint pain coming on, whether it's in our knees, lower back, wrists, you name it, we don't lay on a buddy's table and get... So you've got to skip it. Backflash on Twitch. Than Kamala Harris is a form of intellectual fraud. And Boo! Boo! You wrote it down, sir. How dare you write it down? Boo! And I reject the use of identity politics in this party. It has been a cancer coming from the left, and I'm sick and tired of the double standards the people of this country are too. Having two X chromosomes does not immunize okay, you from thank criticism. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Governor Haley, Boo. you respond. No. It, it's not worth my time to respond to him. You, you have been using identity politics at every step. She knows it's true, and that's why she's actually okay, Sir, we're not going to give you a response to the question that was to you. Okay. we got to move on to this. Now, by arrangement uh, with the Republican National Committee, we've got two questions for you about the Justice Department and our election system. Here's Tom Fitton with Judicial Watch. Governor Christie, this one's for you. That's because of that thing that happened. President in, Trump yeah, and many of his supporters this. claim federal law enforcement agencies have abused his civil... Look at this fucking skinwalker. Fucking hell. <laughs> Couldn't even get the... Couldn't even get the human mask on to be. <laughs> oh, I'm in. Right. All right. For the last eight years by, among other things, spying on him and now prosecuting him while having treated Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden with kid gloves. A recent Gallup poll shows that Americans think more highly of the U.S. Postal Service than they do the FBI or Justice Department. What would you do as president to restore the faith of the American people in these agencies? Well, first off, I'm the only person on this stage who's actually done a job in the Department of Justice. I was the U.S. Attorney in New Jersey in the fifth largest office in this country, appointed by President Bush on September 10th, 2001. And it was an extraordinary time in this country to be on the front lines of fighting the greatest attack against our country Here we go. since Pearl Harbor. 9-11. years I spent in the Justice Department, and one of the reasons I am is because I had an attorney general when I came in named John Ashcroft. And John Ashcroft stood up and told each and every one of us our job was to do one thing, to make sure justice was done every day, regardless of partisanship, regardless of gender or race or any other consideration. And that's what we did for seven years, and at a time when our country was at its greatest moment of danger in the last 40 years, we did exactly that, and there was not another domestic terrorist attack on this soil. So what I would do... Yeah, well, Bush was busy, was had that experience. <laughs> he was busy making all that money in that Iraq and that. So. ...is to pick an attorney general <laughs> who will absolutely do the same thing that John Ashcroft did. To pick U.S. attorneys who will only care about making sure that justice is done without regard to any other consideration but the facts that are presented and whether someone is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt and the government can prove it. We have had attorneys general like Eric Holder and Loretta Lynch and Jeff Sessions and now our current attorney general who have not met that standard. And the only way you restore people's faith in the justice system is to put someone like that in charge of the Justice Department and then as president to get at the hell out of the way on anything that involves criminal investigations. If a president's involved in trying to do something and put their thumb on the scales, Donald Trump says he will do, 
That makes people much less likely to believe our justice system can be fair. Thank you. Thank you. Governor DeSantis, this next one's for you. Back to Tom Fitton. Back to Tom Fitton. Many Republicans are concerned about the legitimacy of elections. A federal judge just ruled that Pennsylvania must count undated mail-in ballots. And unlike Alabama, many states still don't require any identification to vote. What should states do now to increase election integrity and voter confidence for the 2024 election? Well, Tom, thanks for the question. Thanks for what you guys do at Judicial Watch. It's really, really important. There's a lot of corruption in this government. You guys are doing a great job. What you should do for election integrity is do what we did in Florida. 20 years ago, Florida and elections was a joke. Everyone would <laughs> laugh at it. Uh, I came in, I removed a couple supervisors from South Florida. We require voter ID universal, no Zuckerbucks, no mass mail balloting, and no ballot harvesting. We even have Thanks, Tonga. that prosecute Happy New Year, people year, brother. Uh, for violating election laws. The result of that in both 2020 and 2022, we counted millions and millions of votes on election night. You got to love it. Like... 20 years ago it was a joke and then you go and you look and you go oh, oh yeah <laughs> yeah ah jeb you did it we all know produce the results it was transparent and everybody was happy that is not happening throughout this country but let me tell you this as the nominee i think it's important not every state's where we need it to be there is ballot harvesting in places like nevada all these places mm -hmm. i am not going to fight with one hand tied behind my back i'm going to have organizations in all the swing states if they're harvesting we're harvesting if they're zuckerbucks we're zuckerbucks we are going to exploit whatever the rules are i favor changing the rules to be like florida and some of the other states that have done a good job but until then we have to do that and then just to, on the justice department and F FBI. I mean, I remember being, uh, you know, in Iraq working with FBI on the ground and being, uh, and then I was a special assistant. I used to have such a high regard for these agencies. What they did to Donald Trump with the Russia collusion was one of the biggest abuses of power in the history of our country. These agencies need to be cleaned out. Uh, with me, you'll have a new FBI director on day one. Uh, we're going to clear out the DOJ. Doing a lot on day one, by the way, you, you will notice. Buckle your seatbelts. There's going to be a new sheriff Thank in town. You. Yeah, right, you said that already. Break. We're going to come back in one minute. China, up next. China, up next. The China. Welcome back to the final GOP presidential primary debate of 2023. We're going to talk about our college campuses, starting with you, Ambassador Haley. House Republicans yesterday hauled elite university presidents up to Capitol Hill to answer for the displays of anti-Semitism on college campuses. These leaders, including the president of Harvard, were asked whether calling they were. for the genocide of the Jews would violate school policies against harassment and intimidation. All of them said it would depend on the context, including whether that speech veers into conduct. Probably one of the most bonkers thing ever and i've been talking about this for a while and people don't like to hear it when it's in the podcast and i get called a zionist but yeah the, the kind of a lot of anti-semitism going on in america right now and not coming from the sources the media say it is it's definitely on the lefty side of the aisle that clip of those university uh, deans refusing to condemn anti like anti-semitism and say it's against their like code of conduct is fucking Bonkers. Like, it's actually mental. Wild times. These schools That's what Nikki says. Society should balance the imperative of free speech against the need to prevent radical activists from harassing and intimidating others. It was disgusting to see what happened. You know, mm. if this had been the KKK that was doing protests on those campuses, oh, yeah. every one of those college presidents would have been up in arms. This is just as bad. The idea that they would go and allow that kind of pro-Hamas protest or agree with the genocide of Jews and try and say that they needed context on that, there is no context to that. This is what we need to do to deal with it. First of all, we have got to get foreign money out of our universities. You've got Arab money, you've got Chinese money, you've got others. We need to go to every university and say you either take foreign money or you take American money, but the days of taking both are over. The second thing we need to do... 
The second thing we need to do is we need, Biden made a mistake not including anti-Zionism in the definition of anti-Semitism. If you don't think that Israel has a right to exist, that is anti-Semitic. We will change the definition so that every government, every school has to acknowledge the definition for what it is. The third thing is we really do need to ban TikTok once and for all. Yeah, don't, know, yeah, you, don't know about that. And here she comes with the TikTok. 30 minutes oh, yeah. that someone watches TikTok. TikTok chop. Every day. They become 17% more anti Semitic, more pro Hamas based on doing that. Now, I don't know where Nikki's pulling these numbers from, but imagine it. Imagine the concept, right? So you're watching TikTok, yeah? And I watch a TikTok video and I just, I've become 70% more anti Semitic, right? So, okay, now I'm 70%. Let's say, my, let's say I started at zero, right? <laughs> now I'm 17%. So if I watch another video, I, what? I'm like 34 and, and, and then. Does it keep going or how does the maths work? Like, how would you even measure? So imagine anti-Semitism as if it was some sort of like constituent part of your personality. And you're just like, you know, well, I watched 10. <laughs> I watched 10 TikTok videos. Holy shit. Let's invade Poland. <laughs> it's just fucking so stupid. It's just such an insane... By the way, where were the fact-checkers on this one, right? Where where were the fact-checkers on this one? That is the most unbelievable thing, like, out of all the dumb stuff that's been said in all of these dumb debates, that is the dumbest... Like, a moderator's got to pull a card there and go, what are you talking about? Where's the, what's the source? How do you measure anti uh, it, It's crazy. It, it, like, she must have the number wrong, but, you know, fuck it. Nobody, nobody pulled a card on it anyway, apart from a few Twitter memes. We now know that 50% of adults, 18 to 25, think that Hamas was warranted in what they did with Israel. That's a problem. When campuses also don't go and protect when they have these rallies and you've got students that are scared, we need to go to these universities and say, if you're not going to protect these students, if you're not going to acknowledge anti-Semitism, we'll take your tax-exempt status away. That'll fix it, and that'll take care of it for good. I'm staying with you, Ambassador Haley. On October 6th, <laughs> the Israeli <laughs> government thought it had a clear-eyed view of the threat from Hamas. In fact, according to the New York Times, it even had Hamas's attack plan and dismissed it as an aspiration. The Israelis were wrong. In our country, the FBI director told the Senate panel just yesterday that he sees, quote, blinking red lights everywhere and that the threat level has, quote, gone to a whole nother level since October 7th. Uh -oh. Which of the threats facing our country do you worry could blindside us? What worries me and what keeps me up at night is what happens between now and Election Day while Joe Biden's in office. That's what worries me more than anything else. But I'll tell you that America right now is acting like it's September 10th. We better remember what September 12th felt like because it only takes one. And whether you're looking at open borders that are allowing people to come in. Uh, just uh, again, it for for September 11th, it didn't take just one. It, it, <laughs> it took it was a pretty coordinated effort, actually. But just uh... Iran knows the easiest way to get to America is through the southern border, and we're not doing anything to stop it. We've got to get the foreign infiltration out of our country, whether it's in our schools, whether it's on our social media, whether it's we need to stop all foreign lobbying that's happening to members of Congress, and we need to start securing America again. Until we do that, we are going to be at threats. We've got to look at Iran, China, and Russia want to destroy the West. We have to start acting strong again. We've got to start protecting Americans. Right now, Americans don't feel protected, and we're not doing anything to strengthen it. So Joe Biden continues to be a problem. That'll change on Election Day. Do you want to know how to find cheap flights on Kayak? Head to Kayak, add your origin and your destination. Bit much to run that ad after a segment about 9-11. Anyway, uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. Um, it's also my understanding, having read the 9-11 uh, report multiple times, uh, I don't think any of the uh, hijackers were in the country illegally. <laughs> you know, it's like they, they were in the country legally. And, you know, so just saying, you know, it's like, don't know if securing the southern border is going to stop that one. 
Taiwan. Right, we're into the last 20 minutes, people. If China invades Taiwan, would you send American troops? Here we go. Look at him. Look at him. With the death eyes. Ron DeSantis. I think that's the important thing. We need a strategy of denial so that we're deterring Xi's ambitions. What if it doesn't he work? Want, it's going to work. Chi uh, Taiwan's an ally. We have long-standing American policy, and, and, and you know how that's done, and we will follow that. Uh, but here's the thing. Taiwan is important not just because of semiconductors. It's important because if China is able to break out of this first island chain, they're going to be able to dominate commerce in the entire Indo-Pacific. They will use that to export authoritarianism all around the world, including here in the United States. You look at some of these guys, actually some of them that are supporting Nikki on Wall Street, they grovel to China. Uh, anytime something happens, they got to go do that. So they already exert a huge amount of authority uh, over this country. It will get a lot worse. So deterring China's ambitions is the number one national security uh, uh, task that I will do as president, and we will succeed. The 21st century needs to be an American century. We cannot let it be a Chinese. You know which airline ranked lowest for satisfaction? It's Benji. To you next on Taiwan. You said if you want to stop Xi from invading Taiwan, quote, let's open a branch of the NRA in Taiwan and put an AR-15 in the hands of every family and train them how to use it. That will it. give Chi a taste of American exceptionalism, end yes. quote. The National Police in Taiwan announced a zero gun policy last year. Is this a serious policy proposal? And if it isn't, why do you keep repeating it? Well, it's part of a broader deterrence strategy. And so I think I'm going to respectfully disagree with Ron here. I think the next U.S. president needs to be crystal clear that at least for the foreseeable future, the U.S. will absolutely defend Taiwan. And it is with that clarity that we actually achieve deterrence. But I have a broader strategy than that. We need to get on side in our relationship with India, take it to the next level. India has to be able to block the Andaman Sea, which is where China gets most of its Middle Eastern oil supplies. That's critical. I also do believe the Second Amendment is a critical way of preventing foreign autocrats from being able to... It's worked in America. Why wouldn't it work in Taiwan? So it is part of a broader strategy. But I do think that we need to be specific about our deterrent strategy, or else Xi Jinping is just encroaching by the day. And the reason not why we're not going to in China, I want to be crystal clear, is because we're scared. Why are we scared? Because we depend on them for our modern way of life. Why do we depend on them for our modern way of life? It's because Nikki Haley's latest friends like Larry Fink have created <laughs> commingled economies with BlackRock telling Exxon and Chevron they can't drill here while being a shareholder of PetroChina, not applying those same constraints in China. So it is our economic dependence on China that makes us scared. If that were a Russian spy balloon, we'd have shot it down in an instant. If that were a Russian spy balloon in Cuba, we'd be, turning the, we'd, be, we'd be actually going hard on them instead of turning the other way as we are with China. So it comes back down to that economic dependence. We cannot depend on them for our pharmaceuticals, our semiconductors, and people have been lied to for a long time. Our own military, the F-35 jets that we make in this Thank country, you. depend on China, and it's Thank going to take you. an outsider to fix that broken establishment. Thank you, Mr. Ramaswamy. Ambassador Haley, would you like to respond? God. Uh-oh. Samsonite. Brought to you by when it comes to China, Crown Taiwan, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Keep China from going into Taiwan is one, make sure that we win in Ukraine, that we protect our friends, but also let China know that there'll be hell to pay if they go into Taiwan. They need to know that there is going to be a force that's going to go against them. And they need to know it's not just going to be the United States. That is why we need to build our partnerships with India, with South Korea, with Japan, with the Philippines, with Australia. We need to start pulling that alliance together. And the first way we do that is we need to make sure that on day one, we look at the fact day one. that whatever, if China pulled the rug out from under us tomorrow, would we be ready? Think about what happened during COVID. Everybody told you to wear a mask. They were made in China. Everybody told you to take a COVID test. They were made in China. Everybody went and, I mean, everything that happened, if you go to the drugstore. Kind of appropriate, really, because fucking COVID was made in China as well. So, I mean, yeah, why fucking, why stop with just the disease, Nikki? Or all those medicines are made in China. We have to make sure that we are not relying on China for anything related to our national security, which means let's start focusing on doing deals Thank with you. our friends now. Thank you, Ambassador. Governor Christie, I'd like you to weigh in on that. And um, do, do you think arming every family in Taiwan with an AR-15 is a plausible policy? Yeah, you know, yeah, let's do I, that. I don't think we have constitutional authority over uh, Taiwan to 
give them a second amendment i think they can only do that for themselves but look I, the only I right answer by the way Once again i don't want to play the role of actually answering your question which is if china went after taiwan you're absolutely right i would as president have us go militarily and defend them uh, secondly i'm not afraid based upon those I'm economic not relationships afraid. To do that because these economic relationships mean nothing nothing if what's going to happen is that China is going to come and act in that region of the world however they see fit. It's not right. And, and, and I'll say this about um, what you know, I heard from Nikki earlier. She said that Donald Trump was good on trade. He wasn't. And the proof that he wasn't good on trade with China is that all he did was impose tariffs, which raised the prices for every American. You want to know what has contributed to inflation in this country? Yes, it's more government spending. Yes, it's the fact that we're printing too much money. Absolutely. But it is also the increase in prices that were driven by Thank Donald you. Trump's tariffs. And, and one last thing. You can't say he was good on trade because he didn't trade. He didn't change one Chinese policy in the process. He failed on it. Thank you, Governor Christie. Governor DeSantis, switching subjects. <laughs> Dead silence. In years, like Bill Burr in Philly, that one, Christie, mate. Come on. To repeal Obamacare. Trump repeatedly promised to replace it with, quote, something terrific, but yeah. failed to propose anything. Like everything else. You're now promising something better. But Florida has more uninsured people than almost any other state. Why should Americans trust you? more than any other Republicans who've disappointed them on this issue? Well, I think we have millions of Americans who do not have access to affordable health care. And it's not just getting some type of card and Medicaid, because a lot of times they don't even get access to doctors. Do you actually get access to care? Uh, the other thing is we have millions and millions of people don't have access to good doctors and good hospitals. Florida did not expand Obamacare. I think the states that did that, uh, I think are struggling financially. So that, yes, we declined to do that, and I don't think that that was the right policy to do. Uh, but we are going to go after the cost you're paying too much for everything. We've actually addressed this in Florida in some ways, but you need price transparency. You need to hold the pharmaceuticals accountable. You need to hold big insurance and big government accountable. And we're going to get that done. I think it's very, very important economically. I think it's very, very important for, for the country that we get that done. Go ahead. Yeah, so I actually wanted to very personal issue to our family. I wanted to take actually a minute to recognize my wife who's here today. Badass surgeon. She did a bunch of cases with cancer survivors earlier today. Flew here to be not tonight. We'll be back at 7 a.m. in Columbus, Ohio tomorrow, taking care of those patients in the OR. And on the front lines of people who have actually not swallowed for years. And here's what's something that's awful that's happening in our healthcare system. <laughs> Wait. They'll pay for anything. Was that like a subliminal message about the state of his fucking marriage? Like, like, and I just want to talk about people who haven't swallowed for years. Unrelated to my marriage, by the way. But, you know, just putting it out there, like, you know, not even on a birthday, love. <laughs> this is the real tyranny in this country. But for the procedures that can actually make these patients better, we have a broken healthcare system that doesn't pay for it. My wife, Apoorva, in many cases, does not get paid for those procedures. She does them anyway because it's the right thing to do. But that does not work system-wide. So here's the answer. We don't have a health care system in this country. We have a sick care system. We need uh -oh. to start having diverse insurance options in a competitive marketplace that cover actual health, preventative medicine, diet, exercise, lifestyle, and otherwise. And okay. here's how we deliver that end the antitrust exemptions for health insurance companies. That's where the competitive marketplace begins. Next that's crony capitalism, and that's the answer. Okay, through Operation Warp Speed... Not wrong there, though. The Trump administration and private industry developed a COVID vaccine in record time. The program protected the drug companies from virtually all lawsuits over vaccine injuries. <laughs> the government has a program to compensate for such harm, but critics say it is a black hole of bureaucracy. Uh... 12,000 claims filed, 10% decided, only eight payouts so far in a forum with no right to counsel, no hearings, no appeals. Mr. Trump says he's very proud of warp speed. Should he be? Well, this question specifically on liability goes back to actually Reagan. And Reagan is a president who I admire. Many of us do. I think that reviving that spirit is in many ways going to be good for this country in so many ways. But one of the areas where he erred was this special form of lobbying to say that one kind of manufacturer, a vaccine manufacturer, 
cannot be sued for their product liability. So I have pledged it is part of my legislative agenda. We will repeal that, just like we will repeal every other form of crony capitalism. People who have been harmed by those vaccines deserve accountability. They cannot be forgotten Americans. And I think one of the top lessons we learned from that COVID pandemic is that free speech in this country is most important in those alleged times of emergency. If we had been allowed to openly debate the merits of those vaccines, they would have been never mandated in the way that they were. And in general, I don't think that we should want capitalism and democracy to share the same bed anymore. It's time for a clean divorce. Let companies be companies, but I don't like the crony capitalism. This dates back a long time in both parties. And I think that we need to end the lobbying. And I personally believe that if you have been working in the government, you should not lobby that government for 10 years. If you have been a government elected official doing deals with companies, be they Boeing or be they pharmaceutical companies, <laughs> you should not join the board of the company for 10 years after. Boeing's an the example I could use right FDA, now. The leader commissioner of the FDA ended up on the board of Pfizer. Nikki Haley did deals with Boeing, ends up on the board of Boeing. I don't care if it's a Republican or a Democrat. We need some basic principles that end the corruption in government. That's how we got the health insurance exemptions. That's how we got the pharmaceutical product liability okay, exemptions. We end we, the corruption. We Bye, need Governor. we need a reckoning for what this government did during COVID-19. That includes a the reckoning. NRA shots. They put it out. It was experimental. People wanted it. Then the government started trying to mandate it to say you don't have a right to put food on your table if you don't take an MNRA shot that was under emergency use. They tried to uh, take nurses away. Now, in Florida, we blocked that. We provided protections for everybody so that they wouldn't lose their job. You also have the FDA approving an MNRA shot for six months old babies. There was no data to support that. They're doing it because big pharma will make money. So I'm going to go in there, CDC, NIH, FDA. We're going to clean house. There's going to be a reckoning because right now nobody's been held accountable for any of the damage, and they're going to try to do it again. When I'm president, this will never happen to our country ever again. Thank you, Governor DeSantis. And we will be right back in just a few uh -oh. minutes. Uh-oh. It's, it's, it's closing, we'll get, statements, closing statements, guys. At the Republican We're right going to have our own reckoning. But first, here's a fucking YouTube ad for a shit mobile game. Do you want to know how to find no, cheap? Welcome back to the Kayak Gang. Republican primary debate here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We're going to do one final question before closing statements, and we want to get you all in. So we're going to give you four. Look at that audience, by the way. What a fucking Governor what a Christine, collection that was. With you. Which former president would you draw inspiration from for your own presidency and why? I would draw inspiration from Ronald Reagan. Of course. Um, in the last, uh, the last year, Republican president is acceptable to praise in any way, shape, or form. How Reagan, original, Chris. It's going to be called What Would Reagan Do? That book's going to come out early in 2024. And what I learned more than anything else was that Ronald Reagan was a slave to the truth. Ronald Reagan stood up for the truth, whether it was popular or unpopular at the moment. In 1964, he stood up against the John Birch Society when it was very unpopular to the party to do it, but he would not put up with our party standing for lies and deceit, even if it gave him political progress. That's the kind of president that I will be, and I would draw that inspiration from the 40th president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Ambassador Haley. <laughs> He's got nothing! Well, I have to say too, I think no George one's applauded Washington, once for Chris Christie. Holy shit, what a nightmare. Had, uh, how do you go and take on this great American experiment and make sure that the people are protected? And they always knew that government was intended to secure the rights and freedoms. Even the, the fucking Borg queen is going to get applause now. And then you look at Abraham Lincoln and you look Gotta at the say, challenges Lincoln. and you look at the division that happened in our country and the ability to lead in spite of the loud noises and say, what will bring out the best in people to get us to go forward is always something that's important. And I think we need that now more than ever. Said nothing. Governor DeSantis. Applause. Uh, Reagan, Washington, Lincoln, excellent. Uh, one of the guys I'll take inspiration from is Calvin Coolidge. Now, people don't Ooh. talk about him a lot. He's one of the few yeah. presidents that got a lot of Coolidge fans. Oh, yeah. He understood Fucking love Calvin. The role of the federal government under the Let's Constitution. Go. We need to restore the U.S. Constitution as the centerpiece of our national life. What I love about this is like, it's like they're having a fucking debate about who's like the fucking, who's the greatest of all time. 
Well, you know, a lot of pe- Nicky said Messi and Chris Chris Christie went with Ronaldo, of course. But one guy who's not getting a lot of people talking about him is Zidane. And I'm going to go with Zidane, Zidane, actually. Like, what the whole fuck is this shit? It's presidents, for fuck's sake. And that requires a president who understands the original... Spoiler, it's Maradona. Constitution, ...who has a good sense of the Bill of Rights and who knows how we've gone off track with this massive fourth branch of government, uh, this administrative state which is imposing its will on us and is being weaponized against us. So Silent Cal knew the proper role of the federal government. The country was in great shape when when he was president of the United States. And we can er 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 learn a awful lot from Calvin Coolidge. Over to you, Mr. Ramaswamy, to conclude our history lesson. Sure. Well, I will say Ron picked a president who was born on July 4th. I'll pick one who died on July 4th. It's Thomas Jefferson. He was 33 years old when You've he said wrote this. the Declaration of Independence. And you all are sitting on a swivel chair today. He invented the swivel chair while he was at it. I, I don't... <laughs> reasons to love Thomas Jefferson. He invented the swivel chair. Vivek, you're fucking mental. By the way, also, you know, he was 33 when he wrote the Declaration of Independence, but the average life expectancy was 35. So, you know, it just... While writing that Declaration of Independence, that's that founding spirit that we miss, that we're the pioneers. We're the explorers, the guy who sent him out on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Why did he say it like that as well? And ladies, you're all enjoying those swivel chairs. <laughs> Zip, oh, well, uh, you know, and if I'm president, I too will invent a type of comfortable, functional chair that ladies can enjoy. Like, what the fuck is happening? And I think a lot about what would Thomas Jefferson say to today's Republican Party. And I think one thing he'd remind us of. We haven't talked about it as much tonight, but I think it is one of the interesting ideological discussions we're having in our party is freedom of speech. You get to express your mind freely, no matter how heinous the opinion. Thomas Jefferson understood that. <laughs> All He's right. an inspiration Thank you, for sir. me. <laughs> I'm just cutting you off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck your free speech. Nonsense. Governor Christie, would you like to begin? Sure. Please. Thank you. Thank I you. want you all to kind of picture in your mind's election day. Yeah, there You'll yeah. all be heading to the polls to vote. I will. And that's something that Donald Trump will not be able to do. Because he will be... Are we not storming the Capitol this year, then, Chris? Are we not doing that? All right, okay. will be taken away. You know, you... Look. Boo! Bottom line, you can boo about it all you like and continue to deny reality. But if we deny reality as a party, we're going to have four more years of Joe Biden. When I, my colleagues here raised their hands and said they would support him even if he was a convicted felon, the bigger problem with it is they were confirming the lies he's told to the American people. If you're too timid to take on Trump, believe me, others will, get, will see that timidity. Xi, Putin and the Ayatollah, the border crossers on the southern border, and the criminals in our streets. They'll sense that timidity and they'll take advantage of that failure of leadership. We need to get back to an old American idea that every person is responsible for their own conduct, even a president. I'll be the kind of president who has the humility that knows that you work for the people. It's not the other way around. I will earn your trust. I want to earn your vote. Thank you, Governor Christie. Mr. Ramos. Yeah, 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 enough of that, Christie. I'll use this to just address a topic we didn't talk about tonight, but I think it's one of the most important topics that needs to be discussed. Go on, crypto. That is this climate change agenda that is shattering oh, yeah. this country like right. a set of hands. <laughs> My bad. I said it at the first debate, and I stand by it. The climate change agenda is a hoax because it has nothing to do with the climate. That's what we have to see. 98% reduction in the climate disaster-related deaths in the last century. Eight times as many people are going to die of cold temperatures this year than warm ones. Yet against that backdrop, there's an issue coming up in Iowa. It's core to Iowa farmers. I met Kim Junker, Kathy Stockdale, and other farmers. Notice how he names the people he met. Notice vague sketches. Using eminent domain to do it. That's unconstitutional and it's wrong. And if you thought COVID was bad, what's coming with this climate agenda is far worse. We Mm. should not be bending the knee to this new religion. That is what it is. It is a substitute for a modern religion. We are flogging ourselves and losing our modern way of life, bowing to this new god of climate, and that will end on my watch. It's the most critical issue that's coming up. Funnily enough, the the (laughs) new god of climate was the old god as well. Uh, Gone full circle. Thank you very much. Our country is in chaos. We see it on the southern border. 
We see it in our, on our streets in our cities. We see it on college campuses. We feel it with our economy, with inflation and with debt. And we feel it around the world with wars in Europe and within the Middle East. We have to stop the chaos, but you can't defeat Democrat chaos with Republican chaos. And that's what Donald Trump gives us. My approach is different. No drama, no vendettas, no whining. Just endless I'm war America, for the emperor. Illegal immigration and Chinese infiltration. I envision an America where we unleash our economy and we reject socialism. But more importantly, I envision an America where we rediscover our national purpose and our pride. Thank you. I crushed Joe Biden in Thank the polls. You. And Thank if you, you give me this chance, we will crush him in November and take our Thank country you, back. Governor. Go to Nikki Thank Haley. Thank you, Ambassador com. Haley. Governor, Governor We are in jeopardy, jeopardy of being the first generation of Americans to leave to our kids and grandkids in America less prosperous and less free than the one we inherited. I refuse Might be to sit, you. sit idly by and let that happen. Just but we got to have people that are going to be willing to fight the people that are doing this to us. You can't be these establishment Republicans that just cave at the first sign of opposition. I'll fight for you. We also need to win again as a party. Yes, win the election, which we've struggled to do, but also win on these big issues. And nobody has I He's gone the entire debate without smiling. I can't remember if he throws in one at the end. He shouldn't. Hopefully, they've told him not to smile. For you. We also need leadership. Leadership is not about doing what's easy. It's about being willing to set out that Thank vision, you. knowing... Is there a new sheriff in town? They're going to come at you. I will Thank fight you. the good fight. I will keep the faith, and I will Thank finish you. the race. Thank, Thank you, and God bless Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thanks all of you. Yeah, it was a blast. Uh, duh, 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 duh. You're all right. Thank you for doing that to me. <laughs> he did. He did make it through without smiling. So fair play to him. Now let's just quickly. I I did say I would uh, show you this, so I just need to find it because I did have it open. So just to let you know that, uh, so I'm not lying to you, uh, Chris Christie. When he did do that waddle. This is what Megan Kelly said went on when fucking Chris Christie uh, <laughs> went up and walked Last over. Last night was a video that went viral of somebody in the balcony filming Chris Christie coming over to yours truly during a break at the end of the first hour. And there it is. And kind of getting up in my grill. <laughs> and Got there was all sorts of speculation about what was happening there. I will tell you what was happening there. It was not off the record. He was pissed off. He was mad that he wasn't getting enough questions. And he said, you know, I made it up on this stage and I haven't been able to speak in a while. And, you know, I should have been brought in on that last debate. And, you know, I'm, I had a couple minds of it. I said, we're coming to you. You're going to be happy in the second hour, which I lived up to. So Chris Christie was fucking molding. Reminder, by the way, they actually changed. I don't think he met the original threshold for the Alabama. Obama debate, if memory serves me correct. And they changed it so he could be there. And then he had the audacity to like, wah, wah. <laughs> have you got a mackerel? Wah. Right, as always, uh, it wouldn't be. <laughs> it wouldn't be. Uh, it wouldn't be a debate uh, if we didn't have El Gapo's memes. For those who don't know, El Gapo is a regular... Uh, in the chat on the Discord, join the Rich Cord today with exclamation point uh, Discord. And uh, what he does is, like a sort of political cartoonist in real time, he makes memes and then he sends them to me in real time. And then at the end of the debate, he shows me the memes that encapsulate the debate. It's very clever, very funny. Uh, here we go. <laughs> this, is <laughs> this is one of the ones he made. Uh, you can see there, it's the, it's the meme. So you see, that's where the trouble began. And then it's a picture of Santa trying to smile. That smile, that damn smile. And then it shows that pink line is uh, is DeSantis's uh, approval. <laughs> Cratering. Uh, brilliant. Brilliant combination there, right? And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you this one here. Uh, <laughs> which is the second best one that he did. Obviously, we... Uh, made some fun at Chris Christie's expense for looking like uh, a Batman villain. 
And you can see here, there he is. Wah! He's fully penguined out of his mind there. Doesn't even look, doesn't even look. You, if you, you really have to squint to see it. Is, uh... <laughs> You'd really have to fucking look hard uh, to notice it. Uh, it's just, it's just ridiculous that he's there. But that isn't, that isn't the best one. He did three memes, three whole memes. He sat there, Dickensian style, hunched over his keyboard, and I said, uh, I said, uh, Legion of Doom for the tag team, but he's 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 gone one better. It is, of course, the fucking the, the Dudley boys. There, there, it's the fucking Dudleys, and Vivek. Is there and Rod is there, and they've absolutely wrecked Nikki Haley just <laughs> in it in a table, ladders and chairs match. No doubt, the Dudley Boys have absolutely done it. So this is the meme of the day from El Gapo, and will be the thumbnail for the video. That's an absolute banger. It could only have been better if one of these like little people in the background was actually a secret Chris Christie, like Wah! just lurking in the background, just a little Easter egg. But you know what, El Gapo, who am I? Who am I to, to criticize your genius? So anyway, there you go. Promises made, promises kept, unlike the Republican GOP primary debate.